necessarily agree with the, the government's lines on, you know, what vaping is all about. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily know. I want to see some of the, the, you know, the fact-based, you know, long-term studies that we'll likely get 20 years from now. But um, I can tell people, like, that's how I quit smoking. That's a remarkable story. I just, you know, I know we cut in to this story halfway through, but, you know, it's kind of me just, you know, I want to play devil's advocate with it because it helped me do what it was tasked to do. But at the same time, like, there's a lot of people that are just, just into it. That's what they do. You know, like, they're going hard. It's vape culture. You know, that that's kind of become their life and stuff like that. Supplanted other things that they would otherwise be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now they're hanging out at, at Vape Club, you know, <laughs> on a Thursday I don't know afternoon. if anybody actually just hangs out at sure, Vape Club, sure, but, like, sure she definitely... Well, the ones up by my house, they do. Sure. Really? Yeah, they have lounges. They have Vapor bars and lounges, right? Like, a lot of them, they're not just go in and buy your stuff. They're... No way. There's couches. It's, it's, it particularly caters to the people who are first-time or whatever, right? They're coming in. It's this, this foreign thing, right? The only thing that they've ever heard of is that shit you can buy over the counter in convenience stores, which are all controlled by the big tobacco companies. Never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> buy your vaporizer from a convenience store, people. My God. Do the fucking research. Figure it out for yourself. Actually, like the convenience store vape culture seems uh, like really shady to me. For like, why would you buy it at a, at a convenience store? For people who don't want to do research on what they're doing. And they'll probably find out in the long run that those products are actually more harmful than the cigarettes that they were supposed to supplant. But the jewels. Yeah. The, and what, Vipe. Vipe. That's and, one, right? Yeah, Jewel and yeah. Vipe and all those uh, brands that they sell at convenience stores. Do not buy those. I That's, wonder how, much, how expensive those are, though. Very cheap. As a matter of fact, um, some of them... Uh, you buy the uh, unit, and the mm -hmm. unit's like twenty bucks, and you put okay. yourself into a monthly subscription for I don't remember what it is—a certain X amount of uh, bottles of liquid or unlimited amount of liquid. So mm. the liquid just comes to you, delivered to your door as part of a monthly subscription. No way! Oh, they've made it really easy and attractive to people who don't want to do their research about the products that they're buying. For sure, that's that's the way they had to do it, though. If they put their products into vape stores and had them competing with people where they were forced to go somewhere where people with real knowledge about these things was talking to them, they would never sell a single unit. You know, they're not, that's they're you know they're garbage. They're garbage, and uh, you're supporting big tobacco when you do that. So just know that. Like if you mm. if you're doing this because you're giving a middle finger to big tobacco, the last thing you want to be doing is supporting the convenience store vaporizer brands. You're just putting yourself right back into the the cycle. That's um, that's more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Actually, wow. like the one I have, like the Caliburn, is only like thirty five bucks. Yeah, and it's like it's refillable and everything. Yeah, like super cheap. It's the way it has to be. Yeah. I just actually had cartridges explained to me. I, I I've never had a vaporizer with a cartridge. I was always one of those guys who would go to like those super high end vaporizer stores with that one guy who was Mr. Vape Culture. And we would just spend like 45 minutes there talking about $200 mods, mm -hmm. you know, with like mod with, with, uh, with extended tanks and like, you yeah, know, yeah. it's just like, like going down the rabbit hole of this. It's like, how much do you want to spend? The batteries for these things are like 40 bucks each. That's like a whole nother level of, of well, that's what my last vaping. vaporizer was. And yeah, I used yeah, to yeah. walk around so proud with a smile on my face and just like <laughs> blow these gargantuan fucking clouds. Not because I was an arrogant prick. I just loved the, the beauty of being able to blow a huge cloud of something that tasted good. <laughs> it was just a it's a real treat to do that it's a real treat to be able to smoke in your car and stuff like when you're somebody who, true. who's staunchly against or in your house and everything yeah, like that, yeah. oh the, yeah. the the smoking in the house is such a big deal yeah just to smoke indoors and not have uh like this lingering smell and you can't appreciate that enough i'm i'm it's good yeah and if there's anything like when i'm like like hanging out watching some tv or something like that and it's not like you can just you know it's not like you can just go smoke all the time. So you you, you know, you got to you know, space yourself out and stuff. And it's in it's those in-between moments essentially where I'm thinking, "Man, I just wish I just wish I could take a couple halls right now, you know." <laughs> <laughs> like you, you know, people don't understand maybe like when I for for a period of time even when I was smoking a vaporizer, I actually smoked 0% nicotine. I did mm. it purely for the flavor. 
I was mm. I was in love with that. The, like my sour grape and my and my fragrant field uh, raspberry. I I oh I loved those. The real fruit, the the simulated fruit flavors. I couldn't get enough. <laughs> I would prematurely throw my coils and insert new ones just to get the maximum flavor on every hit. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because yeah. you know how they diminish when the time. when the coils start to go. Yeah, like, yeah. You can really tell the difference. You can, it starts to drop off pretty noticeably. Wait, did you did you start with zero nicotine or did you no? Did you start with nicotine? No, I started up? with uh, my first, the very first uh, liquid I ever bought. If you remember, it was a tiny little Aspire, uh, red Aspire Velos. It had a tiny little tank on oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah. Tiny yeah. little red body and just two buttons with a digital screen. It was very simple. It was like a seventy dollars or something at the time, right? And uh, the very first stuff I ever bought, I was one of those guys who walked in enamored with the fact that this was a vape bar, you know, that people could sit down, mm-hmm. and relax, try out the shit. So uh, I, it was recommended to me that I tried. Uh, was that the one in Dundas? No, this was the one on Stony Creek Mountain. Um, it's, I think it's, is it called Vape Nation? Well, the one that, that I know that is an actual like lounge is a uh, vapor bar. Yeah, in Dundas. This one, this one is a vape nation up on Stony Creek Mountain over here. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember it was the middle of March. It was brutally cold that day, and I was mm-hmm. so like I had this like processing in my head for like weeks. I'm like, you know what? Gotta gotta kick smoking. Gotta kick smoking. Gotta gotta yep. change this up, right? So finally, you know. I decided after work one day, it's pitch black, middle of March, fucking freezing outside. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm, as soon as I'm done work, I'm going over there. You know, I was one of those, I was mm. intimidated by the culture. I didn't understand it, mm-hmm. right? Don't get yourself into it. Go to the convenience store, buy yourself a Vipe, right? Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. But no, no, you force yourself into these uncomfortable situations and you'd be, remark- you'd be remarked about how much you will actually learn Mm-hmm. about things from people who are pretty uh, accommodating considering the fact that you're walking in there thinking that they're going to think you're an idiot. But yeah, yeah, I was recommended this Aspire Velos, uh, you know, $75 unit. And the uh, he he actually recommended to me at the same time um, because I just told, I told him, I'm like, I just finished, you know, smoking. Literally, I had my last cigarette 20 minutes before I got here. And he's like, okay. He's uh, he's like, 12, try this 12 milligram uh, maple tobacco. Okay. Hmm. That was my first experience with vaping, and I will tell you what maple tobacco. Boy, I will tell you what. What did that taste like? Amazing. Really? I could. It tasted like, dude. I'm telling you, like compared to smoking a cigarette, like this was like it tasted like golden grams or something. Like just, <laughs> just a, a French toast crunch is mm. kind of what it tastes. The like. French toast crunch. I couldn't get enough of this thing. I was just instantly hooked <laughs> to this thing. So it was like more on the maple side than it was the tobacco side because I've I've tried the tobacco flavored ones and they always taste so weird. Them. Yeah, yeah, some of them are. Pretty it doesn't weird. taste like tobacco. No, it tastes some, like some weird malt beverage. Yeah, some of them are pretty weird. Yeah, but <laughs> so I'm uh, yeah. No, no, I stick I stick to the fruit stuff. Got mango right now. Truth, I truth like though, I was really impressed with it. I couldn't believe it. I probably bought three or four more bottles before I finished off the maple tobacco because I actually was savoring it. I liked it so much. But I never bought it again. I never bought a tobacco-based one again. Mm. I was straight fruit from there. There was one company which was just dealing straight in the fruits. I can't remember what the name of it is mm. right now off the top of my head. They were straight fruits. Everything was like... Not this one? No. No, no, no. It was a clear bottle. It was a clear bottle. A clear, oh. clear glass bottle with an eyedropper. Mm. Yeah, it didn't have the squeeze top. It had the eyedropper. Weird. It was... I've you know, never seen that. Dude, they made the most remarkably flavored fruit, fruit-based liquids it was yeah (laughs) yeah so that was uh that's how it all got started and then uh i guess i was saying this before we got on air but uh my vaping experience um prematurely ended last july probably around this time somewhat of an anniversary when i uh, left my vaporizer in my car at work on a 40 degree day and the batteries melted out out of the back <laughs> so like it's just just completely crazy. melted and just there was no way of getting it out it was done did you try to haul on it one more th- one more time i did not no. the screen wasn't <laughs> like there was a big <laughs> big illuminated about. screen on it right like it's oh, yeah. when it when you t- touch the damn thing it was it was very welcoming the whole thing would just light up right like mm. you could tell you touch it you're like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty fucked up man. and that one cost me like 180 bucks Oh my god, dude! That was a that was a real deal. Like you were turning the ohms up to like fucking sixty and taking these gigantic 
triple huge hits. Rips. Just so good. Yeah. Full yeah. of sour grape flavor. Just, ugh. I always say that, like, people who go that far into vaping, they're like, that's like the bong culture. Yes. Of vaping, you know. I, I have a habit of um, taking... Whereas, like, the the, pe- the people with the pods are more like, it's more like a joint. Anything that I get involved in, usually I take to an unhealthy amount. <laughs> <laughs> usually, yeah. usually there's this plateau of, like, going through the roof with something before I'm able to bring it back down and kind of stabilize it. You know, like I, I call it an addictive personality, you know, so I got to yeah, be, ve- got to sure. be very careful. Like the reason why I knew better than to do crazy drugs when I was in high school is because had I engaged in that environment, I probably would be that person right now. I mm-hmm. realize that I know my weakness is self-restraint. I know I have an addictive personality. I wish more people knew that about themselves before they got themselves like they use that as a jumping off point in terms of making decisions that they were making in their lives and i think if they did that then they would probably jump into things a lot less you know without mm-hmm, without thinking sure. about it without thinking about it so no i was the same way definitely yeah. have an addictive personality yeah but you know that's just kept me away from a lot of shady shit i also feel like i don't know if this is something you've developed in the last little while or if this is like something that you had before but like you you do have a quality of moderation about you too. <laughs> you know, like I noticed this, this is mm-hmm. the only gentleman I know that drinks a, a, a five hour energy drink in two sessions. <laughs> <laughs> Split it in half, you know? Split it in half. I almost brought him a mini straw <laughs> tonight. I almost brought him a mini straw. And you know what? I, I, I'm not even going to do that all the time. <laughs> I might have one of those what are you like gonna once do, drink a year. a third of it? Like, <laughs> No, I'll have I'll have like one of those like once a year maybe. Are you just like yeah. what do you do? You just put it on the table and then you open the cap and you kind of just let it evaporate into the air. Yes. <laughs> no, I've always been, I've always been like that though. I've always been, been like a little bit neurotic, I guess. Good for you. Yeah, good for I, you. I don't think it's good. No, well, I'll, <laughs> I don't I'll be, know if it like is. for me, that's kind of the opposite of being an addictive personality. Yeah. It's like if you're an addictive personality, that self restraint mechanism yeah. it's it's not there. Like you know, for me, if I buy two energy drinks. It could be me drinking both of them mm. within four or five hours. Mm. Like, why did I do that? Why? Oh, well, I did it so I could save two dollars. But the downside of it is that I have no self restraint. Therefore, I'm probably just going to drink the second one anyway. What mm. good was it? Yeah, weird. I don't know. I, I have that with some things and not with others. Like, definitely with with cigarettes, I was compulsively smoking. Yeah. Um, I have that with coffee too. I'll oh. drink an entire fucking pot of coffee. Like, yeah to myself like i don't like i don't know when to stop and to qual- coffee. And, and to qualify the points i just made about my energy drink consumption i should just qualify that by saying i actually don't drink coffee so there's times when y'all folk would be drinking coffee when i would actually be drinking some, an alternative but i've noticed mm-hmm. this trend in society that person has the right to come up to me and tell me how wrong my choice my life choices are but yeah, if yeah. I was to go up to somebody drinking coffee at 9 a.m. and bitch them out about how poor their life choices are, they would yeah. be like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, but like like we've we've talked about so many times, like it's exactly the same. Yes. You know, in fact, you're probably going to get more caffeine out of a venti from Starbucks than you would a Red Bull. I, I, I would think that's true. Yeah. I would. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but... At the same Not time. the same amount of sugar. No. Obviously. I mean. No. God. I mean, you can get sugar-free Red Bull. It's actually pretty decent. Oh. Uh, it doesn't taste terrible. No, it's not terrible, but, but the, there's the carbonation and the citric acid. Mm-hmm. There's something there that's going on there. If you are the type It's of, the aspartame, man. I think the aspartame really fucks you up. I it's, think it's, you it's might definitely be right. not. It's definitely not healthy for you. I think you might be right. I think it might be the aspartame. Why can't you just make a drink that just doesn't have sugar in it? Why does it have to have a sweetener in it? god damn what a tough question you know if it's already flavored with like what like what is red bull it's it's what flavor is that it's some type of grape honestly you know when you look at it just keep it grape it's not (laughs) like why would you just it's like sugar it's like perrier with energy uh energy components right yeah 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 Yeah, right like it's it's nothing but like you could make something take like you could you know like i like perrier yeah it doesn't taste bad to me because there's no sugar in it you couldn't just pump some caffeine into it and just call it a I get a really, Perrier energy or something. I get a real like, 50-50 mixed response when I talk to people about Perrier. I don't I don't think everybody loves it. I think a fair. lot of people don't give it a chance. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like you, you you don't start off liking bubbled water immediately. It's actually something that you have to buy a few times, usually mm-hmm. in the, in a in a small course of time, and you kind of your your taste buds get adjusted to it, right? I I think that's kind of the case. But like going back to the point about sugar, though, can products pre-manufactured products that are on the shelves in your in your supermarket. I mean, is sugar not the most overused product? I mean, it, it ends up in places that you're literally like it has no business. It has like, you know, can all all canned foods, all condiments, all everything that's not a um everything that's not a fruit or a vegetable. And obviously fruits have sugars too, but we're not talking about natural sugars. We're talking about synthesized sugars. With the exception of fruits and vegetables and maybe your meats, I mean, what the hell in the supermarket doesn't, for some mysterious reason, have sugar in it? Hmm. Right? It's like you, you were just bringing up this like in light of the point of why can't you just make a sugarless energy drink? Why the fuck can't we make sugarless anything? Why are there certain products that simply just show up everywhere? Why is palm kernel oil a thing? <laughs> why is yeah, it really. in everything why is yeah. soy lecithin in everything why is it like a binder or something no is there some like well soy lecithin is a protein substitute mm-hmm. right yeah in, in the absence of more expensive animal proteins they'll substitute they'll, they'll, they'll substitute those products in a lot in, in right many, right yeah with cheaper cheaper protein based alternatives so there's like gas station burritos oh yeah full of soy you can imagine yep yeah those things suck I think even Taco Bell Doritos, I or Doritos, uh, burritos and tacos. I, I don't know. Well, they're Dorito tacos. They are loco, apparently. Loco Doritos. Completely loco. Some Baja Blast. I don't know what's so there. crazy about them. The fucking shell always tastes stale every time I get one. That's <laughs> fucking n- shit. Listen, Taco Bell, that ain't loco. It is actually. It is. Is it? It's so loco. Well, I I happen to disagree <laughs> with you politely. Taco Bell is so loco. It's it's baffling that anybody actually goes there. <laughs> I I think I think you're right. Like yeah. Taco Bell itself is loco, but I don't yeah. think that the, the the Dorito Loco Taco is 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 loco at all. I don't know. Um, their beef burritos are decent. I, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fucking hot slop. But Le- leave it to you to go for the two ninety nine value menu right away. It's slop. <laughs> don't give me the gordita. I want the fucking plain beef burrito no no, no. none of that high-end <laughs> shit give me some of that low quality rice i need that need that garbage <laughs> low low quality rice with bean curd mm. <laughs> i want the stuff that legally can't be classified as meat <laughs> it, com- it comes from a can that says navy corn beef you know <laughs> cat food <laughs> it doesn't chop up very well we got to stick it in the fucking blender before we put it in the pump gun mm. <laughs> Sir, Weird fucking restaurant. Huh? Serve you that warm mayo. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> Mm-mm-mm. It's been sitting around for a while. <laughs> that weird soupy cheese. Oh, oh god! Like that has to be just yeah reconstituted cheese whiz. It's definitely cheese whiz. It's cheese whiz with like a little bit of hot sauce on it, only, just to add flavor. <laughs> only if you choose. Um. Yeah. Only if you choose to have hot sauce on that fucker. Only if you choose. But you're not going to... And then some Baja Blast. Yeah. To oh, wash it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dunk so, it in some Mountain Dew. So are you not, like, I mean, let's end Let's end the Taco Bell conversation on this, but honestly, <laughs> just... <laughs> don't know how we got on this. Go Quick, on forever. Quickly and Taco briefly, Bell. do you not believe that the entire reason why Taco Bell is a hit with the current generation is because of the beverages it serves? Yes or no? Um... No, I don't think so. Oh. I don't think that's the biggest reason. Oh. I think because it's slop and people like slop. Well, in my generation, they didn't. That restaurant would sit dormant for like days on end. There wouldn't be a soul in there. Now when I peep in there, when I go buy it, because I go buy it to hit the plaza there. Um, it, oh, the, it's, the new one. It's all 25 and under. No, no, no. Not that one by not that one by the college. The, the one. one up by my house. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 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 All 25 and under. Really? Yeah, it's like they lost that crowd, and then all of a sudden, like like a light switch went on. Boom, they got them back. It's the Baja drinks. They haven't it's changed. The, they haven't changed their menu. It's not even good, though. but it's not pop. It's loaded with sugar, but it, yeah. they they made it sound like it was something newer and fresher. So people are all up on that. Baja blast, man! Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, can't you get beer there now? Oh, I don't know. 
I'm pretty sure that was something they're they're trying to do. The reality is it's been a while since I've been there, and I really, really don't make a habit of going there very often. Maybe once a year, maybe even less. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know too much about it. Maybe some <laughs> poor smuck that's listening out there knows more about it. You know, maybe we got the Taco Bell crowd listening, and maybe we just pissed them off a little bit. This crowd is definitely a Taco Bell crowd. You think so? Yeah, I think they're more of a. Dur- be honest, I think they're more of like a Doritos and Mountain Dew Co. Red crowd. <laughs> <laughs> they just took five minutes off of gaming to just yeah. like listen to a couple idiots talk shit for a little while. <laughs> I've never had Mountain Dew Code Red. Uh, I've had it, and it is decent, but really, I, yeah, it's not something that you definitely want to make a lifestyle out of. I don't think you don't want to be defined by your beverage. Who's <laughs> lifestyle of Mountain Dew? The Mountain Dew lifestyle? <laughs> the perpetual, I live in my parents' basement and all I do is game and maybe come up for dinner <laughs> type, <laughs> guy, type guy. <laughs> or remember we were talking about lifestyle brands earlier tonight? Yes. Mountain Dew is one of those lifestyle brands. Mountain Dew There's is something absolutely going on. a lifestyle brand. Yes, it is. They have a fucking lifestyle brand. Which is uh, developed nicely into a niche market. Mm-hmm. It's a market that not everybody shares. As a matter of fact, when it comes down to the original flavored Mountain Dew, I I, I despise it. I honestly mm. do. If I'm going to go for something that tastes remotely like Mountain Dew, I'm going to gladly pass up a Mountain Dew and grab a Fresca. Fresca, eh? Yeah, buddy. Mm. Yeah. Fruity. Maybe the only beverage in that convenience store fridge that doesn't have sugar in it. It doesn't have sugar in it? Sugar free. No way. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. But it tastes so sweet. It's a beautiful, because grapefruit is just such a great masker of everything. Mm. Grapefruit is a wonderful thing to, mm. to cook with. To, oh, yeah. Grapefruit is a, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful it. fruit. It is a beautiful, it's versatile. <laughs> it's able to suck up excess acidity. It's able to suck up excess uh, sourness or tartness. And it's able to accelerate the aspartame and make it taste sweeter than it is. And, and it's able to somehow refresh you. It's got an overwhelmingly refreshing flavor to it, grapefruit. I don't know about that. Well, you're, you're I've never been a big fan of grapefruit. And you're lying to yourself. I'm definitely not lying to myself. All of these years. Uh-huh. All of these years. All it would take was would be for you to grab a fresca the next time you're at a convenience store. All right, I'll try a fresca. All right. Tomorrow morning. There's a little bit of fucking orange and lemon in there too, so don't 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 jump to conclusions on the grapefruit. Yeah, but it's like it's not the same as grapefruit juice. It's pretty close. It's very, very tart and very sweet and sour. It's got a just a. Com- mm. It's complex, man. It's complex. Grapefruit is complex. It's complex flavors going on in that thing. You know, it looks exactly like a lemon or a lime, mm-hmm. except the skin is orange and the inside is red and semi sweet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. I have no Depending. idea. Well, you know. I think, like, if, if the grapefruit is a little bit warm, it's fine. I find if it's cold and you bite into a grapefruit, it becomes very bitter. I could see that. For whatever reason, when it's really cold, it makes it worse. I don't know. I don't know. I like my grapefruit any way I can get it. Hmm. I'll steal one if I have hmm. to. What about a mandarin? Yeah. Why are we doing this? I don't know. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> welcome to the, what, sixth installment of the show? Like, what mm-hmm. are we, yeah? And, uh... Episode six. Episode six. Of the Luke Hamilton Tonight podcast. We, guys, honestly, we could have easily been defeated by this point, packed it up, went home, but here we are, for your abuse and torture. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's good. Yeah, it is good. They uh, love it. Yeah. Well, they have to. They love listening to this. They have garbage. to. If they press play, then they have to listen to what we say. It's mandatory. It was their choice to press play. It's, they, they, mm-hmm. They've relinquished mm-hmm. the choice of mm-hmm. whether they want to listen now. Yeah, they've entered some kind of like clockwork mm-hmm. orange agreement. Yes. Where they have to get to the end. This is the uh, this is the chaz of our thought process. <laughs> chaz. You've just you've just <laughs> en- you've just entered our you know our intellectual autonomous zone. Holy fuck! Welcome. No room for police. This is brutal. No, it's not. There's just no room for police here. No, I mean, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Lots of uh, stuff going on in the news. Lots of stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, some of the things that were interesting to us uh, 
mainstream media and, uh, you know, sort of uh, doing a little bit of background investigation on things like multi-level marketing scams. Just a huge call, scams. Yeah. So this is probably not news to all of you guys out there because you're pretty avid. Most of you, I assume, are pretty avid social media users, but I'm actually not on social media at all. So I've probably said that in the past, but <laughs> all the things that you guys probably take for granted come as news to me a little bit. I'm not how f- I'm not sure how far society's gone down the rabbit hole of exploring some of these uh, advertisements that come up on your social media feeds and stuff like that. But there's some sinister shit happening here. There really yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. You've been looking into any of those? Um. There's always sinister shit, man. Since yeah. the since the beginning of fucking social media. <laughs> it's, it's Wait, you're saying social media was sinister in the beginning? You got to be a little fucked up to make that, though, right? I don't think I don't think social media was nefarious in the beginning. I think there was some mm-hmm. sort of Puritan objective attached to it at the beginning, even if mm-hmm. only certain people within the corporation believed it. It's not like today, where you know everybody everybody that works for the the hegemons kind of know that they're pushing the world towards extinction. But you know, I don't think there was that that belief existed in the beginning. Right, like even I bought into Facebook at the beginning. It seemed like something mm-hmm. organic. It seemed like a natural. Uh, it seemed like a natural successor to MySpace. Right, so there was that level of familiarity there. There wasn't that feeling of like being a nefarious entity at the time. Sure, it was also a lot smaller back then. It was a lot smaller. Right, we were talking tens of millions, maybe maybe a hundred million at that time. Now we're talking three billion. Well, I don't know. It's, it's one, almost everybody. One and a half billion people on Facebook alone, for example, as far mm-hmm. as I remember. Yeah, that's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Big surveillance state. Yes. <laughs> oh no people, ab- yeah. absolutely that's yeah, yeah. you know you know it doesn't matter what you're doing out there friends if you guys are using the 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 normal avenues to to be a good corporate citizen you guys are being marketed at all the time right mm-hmm. we go back to go back to show one and we talk about maybe um you know not generally not looking at what pops up on your news feeds or the first few search results if you're somebody who uses google you know, um, being able to kind of see past what's being presented to you as, as something that uh, something that may not uh, be representative of your actual interests on a matter or may not be presenting an issue to you th- through all forms of looking at that particular issue and the mm-hmm. agendas that a lot of these companies have. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, right? Kind of feeding into the multi-level marketing thing, you know? These companies, they know a lot about you. They, they, they watch... Uh, even if you know there's not somebody behind a computer watching your every move all the time, it doesn't take anything to program an algorithm to understand your basic search patterns, uh, to understand your general interests, to understand when you might be at your most vulnerable, and then to market at you uh, during that time. But we also talked about like how you know the extent to which those tools are used. I mean, marketing is only like the first level of of you know the strategy of why your data is being collected right so you know just be careful out there just to reiterate a point here you know be careful out there with uh what information you're giving to people and you know what have you but a lot of these uh, multi-level marketing schemes that end up on your social media feed they end up there by way of your the algorithm determining that you may be particularly vulnerable to such a thing Mm -hmm. which is a scary thing Mm mm-hmm because you know, at the end of the day, these entities that are giving you this uh, information—they're—they're they're, not—they're not vetting the information they're giving you. They're presenting it to you as if it was a fact and if it was true, mm-hmm. right? I've uh, talked about in the past. I've talked about Goop. Goop. <sighs> Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Goop. <laughs> oh yeah. my God, that's uh, Goop. that's a fucking ripe egg. I don't know yeah, if yeah. I, I don't know if anybody out there is actually uh, you know probably some of the females. I'm not sure how many women would listen to a show like ours or if there are any that would be awesome Mm -hmm. but um yeah i mean i'm pretty sure that there uh, if you were to ask any woman who's avid on social media or at least spends a good uh, period of time there they've probably seen an advertisement for goop and goop is a lifestyle brand it's absolutely Mm -hmm. a lifestyle brand it's selling you suede pseudo products that don't work and have never been scientifically proven to do anything Yet they're yet all these claims are attached to the products that they're selling. 
you know, they do this and they cure that and they make this better. And it's like, uh, like the whole, the whole web page should be followed by a disclaimer from scientists with asterisks saying actually not <laughs> true, not true. Yeah, yeah. This has not been scientifically proven mm -hmm. yet. People we talk, and this is something that, uh, Luke and myself talked about earlier. It's just, they're no longer looking, uh, when they advertise to you, they're no longer looking to appeal to your rationality. They're looking to appeal to your emotion, right? The entire economy right now is, is an economy based on emotion. They don't want you making rational choices with how to spend your money because if you did that, then you'd be much more sensible with what you were doing. They want you to look at something and they want you to instantly fall in love with the idea of having that. They want that emotion to override all rationality and they want you to go right after it without thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a psychologically sophisticated way of getting you to part ways with your money. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, Goop's case, like they're selling, I, I think they're like jade vaginal eggs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just in case uh, anybody's not aware of this, you can go and you can, you can either type this in on YouTube and, and find some pretty ridiculous information on goop, but you can also go to their website and you will absolutely as one of their flagship products, see this vaginal egg. <laughs> that, that, that they've been they say oh no no no! you stick it in your vagina and it just it balances your chakras and it realigns your hormones and all this shit and, sure you know, oh yeah yeah and youtube sounds practical youtube's just littered with scientists that are like yeah mm -hmm. no don't you fucking do this at all <laughs> yeah. you're an idiot if you think that this is a smart thing to do another thing that she was uh that she was championing was like uh vaginal steaming <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, what is that supposed to do? I don't know. It's like stand over a steamer and just uh, stick it into your vagina and let the steam do its magic. And apparently, it's supposed to just clean out your insides. Okay. Magic. Um, magic. The the scary thing is that you could. There's definitely a, a certain population of people out there that would believe anything like that. Sure, there is. Yeah. Sure, there is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can get people to buy into anything. I mean, like I saw an ad recently for what i can only describe as a medieval torture device it's a it's a small roller filled with um small metal pins Ooh. that you're supposed to roll on on your head oh my or God. like your your face and it's supposed to promote hair growth really yeah but when you when you look at these you look at these guys like rolling it on their head it's like this looks like a fucking torture device who is falling for this who's buying this thing that's stabbing you consistently to somehow promote hair growth. And then they have like the before and after shot and whatever. It's like, well, well you could you could you could doctor that like <laughs> easily. Yeah, the algorithms uh, uh so like, sole purpose this? determine your vulnerabilities and your weakest points and then mm. to, to market at you at the most uh, when you're at your most vulnerable. And that's how you end up with a bunch of people that are falling for these things. Thinking, yeah, thinking that like you're talking about people that are probably at home right now. They're probably not of good means. They're probably making not very much money compared to what they were making. They've got all these social insecurities about themselves. Uh, YouTube also knows based on the usage that this guy tries to branch off of his normal cat watching videos at 8 p.m. to watch videos about hair loss, and he probably cries himself to sleep. And the, the algorithm fucking knows Maybe. it. The algorithm yeah. knows it. Okay. And you better believe that that guy's receiving an ad for that draconian hair spike pin mm -hmm. at 815 when he's just finishing his first half of his ice cream. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but that's hilarious. It's, it, it's, it's, it's funny. But it's I guess, sickening at the same time. I guess people care that much about their hair, but... People right. care about a lot of things that don't matter. If there's mm -hmm. one thing that remains true across all societies is people value things that you would otherwise think are just stupid, pointless shit true right people mm -hmm. psych psychology is a funny thing you can get people to believe that they need something if you mm. do it in just the right way mm. that's that's what the algorithm is it's a so sure. sophisticated way of determining yep. exactly the right time to strike yeah and that's how i end up with a ball trimmer that's it yeah 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 proud owner of a new ball trimmer Fucking and manscape Fuck ball trimmer. <laughs> fucking right, buddy. We're all envious, okay? Yeah, well, you know, that was a good purchase. You know, you know. by the way... I am not I, I am not angry about that purchase. By the way, uh, we're not going to throw your name out there, but you know what company you are. You're social marketing yourselves. Uh, if you want to reach out to the show and you want to <laughs> I already a, said the name. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Oh, okay. Well, this is how you get sponsors. Hey. 
<laughs> well, I was gonna, I was gonna do the carrot and stick approach. You're going right for the, right for the jugular there. Nope. <laughs> I don't know what. On my we, last episode, I talked about. Is it those? I, I talked about BC butt online for like half an hour. It's those new shaved balls that are giving you all the confidence, isn't it? It's they those, were always shaving. It's those freshly. Now shaved, it's just easier. It's those fresh, to shave them. freshly shaved balls that are giving you all that new confidence. There's, there's some good airflow down there. It's great. There is absolutely beautiful airflow. One must <laughs> <laughs> little little itchy though, but we're, we're working on it. Yeah. But honestly, like, who doesn't shave? Yeah, no, 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 one hundred percent, right? You never want to be caught in a situation with a female where you're just, you're just, you know, you're you're just you're burgeoning. You don't you don't want that. You don't want that. It's not an attractive feature. It's more personal for me. I, I don't even like the feeling. I yeah. just, it's, it's, no. it's more for me than anything. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Manscaping yeah. is a real thing now. I mean, it's a real thing. 10 to 15 years ago, people would get like laughed out of the building about manscaping and stuff like that. Now it's like, it's just a thing. People do it. Get over it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We're all talking about it in the open, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's ads for it, you know? Yeah. I mean, every th- it seemed like a lot more things were taboo back when you were a kid. You know, you just there's certain things you wouldn't talk about, but like now, it just it's just whatever. Yeah, now everything's fine. Fucking whatever. Cares. Well, that's because everybody's weird in their own way, right? It's a, the reason yeah. why nobody really discusses their 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 Pornhub uh, habits and what they search and shit like that. I mean, do you really want people knowing how far you go with that? Pro- <laughs> pro- <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> if I, anybody talks about their their porn search history they're, they're only scratching the surface that's right it's the tip of the ice they are definitely not giving you the full <laughs> rundown no way no no no, way. no. so if no. they went if they went to a level that you're already uncomfortable with you got to imagine that they went way down <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> if they're willing yeah. to tell you about that you gotta you gotta believe they went way down mm. <laughs> you know uh, i don't know what that even constitutes <laughs> fuck <laughs> yeah so it could be anything yeah for sure Pornhub's basically the dark web well i just Fuck. i just you know i'm just waiting for these uh fucking pornographic videos of women inserting vaginal eggs and shit like that so i can just finish my job at 2 a.m yeah yeah that's what it is they got to turn it into porn they got to sensationalize it they got to make it that's got to be out there right oh yeah that's yeah 100%. oh yeah that's available yeah uh, it's it's there somewhere yeah. I use my goop egg to blow a load or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> like, <yeah. laughs> this isn't what it was People made. People are searching for it. This isn't what it was made if for. If you can think it, somebody's looking for it. <laughs> I uh, I try to uh, reduce my imagination about that just to my own realm. <laughs> it makes me feel comfortable and secure. <laughs> <laughs> just keep it up here, man. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. It doesn't 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 need to be said on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pornhub uh, Pornhub aside, um, to get to get back to what we were talking about, like the schemes. Good. These internet schemes. I mean, I I sent you that video of of John Locke a mm, little while ago. Amazing. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. not John Locke. Dan Locke. Dan Locke. Not John Locke. <laughs> he getting, was a con you're, artist. You're getting, you're getting your 17th century uh, British libertarians mixed up with your fucking con artist. <laughs> hey. Neo feudal con artist. Could be both con artists. And I'm sure a lot like, of people like where where did you first Locke, where did you first see up. him? Where did you where was the first what was your first I can't even about? remember. It was something it was like one of his videos was uh, recommended to me on YouTube through something. I don't know what I was watching that it came up, but I looked into it and it was after watching a couple of his videos, I was like, this is, seems like a very interesting person because, like, he comes off as, like, a very, you know, this crazy millionaire entrepreneur and all this shit. <laughs> and you're like, you got, you kind of have to take his word for it because, like, I don't know. I just saw two videos and this is what he's talking about. So I'll take his word for it. And then I did, like, a, uh, a quick Google search uh, on his name oh, no. and the first first video that came up in the google search was like a debunking thing oh. so this guy that was going through of like this is how he actually makes money it's like he has the um he does these conferences right so he teaches people how to do these high ticket sales or whatever selling whatever he never says what you're actually selling or like how you're getting clients it's just like i'm going to teach you how to sell 
So you got to fly out to fucking Vancouver for his uh, his um, seminars. His seminars cost two thousand dollars like a night, and then you 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 immediately put two and two together. It's like, oh, he's not selling anything. He's just collecting money from people who think he's actually selling the, to, uh, to people. But he has no clients. The impressive. He's not actually selling anything. He's just telling people. He's just talking shit and collecting money. The impressive uh, ability to get people that are other that otherwise don't have that type of money to part ways with money. Mm-hmm. The idea of selling hope mm-hmm. to hopeless to people who otherwise feel very hopeless is yeah, that's and a, a lot of people are really desperate. It's amazingly you know, euphoric when mm-hmm. you think about it. There's not even a high degree of psychology involved in this. This is literally this would be like uh, you know telling a starved prisoner that he's not getting any food until he divulges information about the unit that he was captured from. I mean, it's no different. It's, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a holdout scenario. You're not getting, um, you're, you're basically, you're basically ensuring a steady stream of very desperate people and you're appealing to their emotions because you're telling them, first of all, you can be super successful like me, or you can make X amount of dollars uh, every month, and there you are sitting there watching me. And why are you sitting there watching me? Because you're not me. Well, let you, let me teach you to be me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So you're getting you're getting these. That's peop- the that's the new business model. Yep. Yeah. There's you're a sell- lot of people getting rich off of just telling and, and people how to get rich. That's right. And and the thing is, like a lot a lot of people may not understand this is that person that's telling you that he is the product. He's selling you on him to make money. And in return, you're selling him to other people to make money, mm-hmm. right? And that's the structure of oh, yeah. the whole situation, right? You're made to believe that you're this independent business owner and, you know, you're going to eventually, if you just keep paying enough for these seminars, you'll eventually be able to buy your way into a, a, a huge uh, Rolodex of high, high clientele and you'll be in Dan Locke's inner circle and you'll be able, and what are you doing when you're in Dan Locke's inner circle? Well, you're selling him. Mm-hmm. You're helping him sell him to other people that are emotionally and economically vulnerable, mm-hmm. and that's the business model. Yep, that's exactly it. So the new the new pyramid scheme. That's a little yeah. bit. That's a little bit insane. There's a lot of people out there that are looking at those videos, and uh, they are convinced by what they see that. And you know, it's like it's like we said, right? Like like when we were talking earlier about uh, this particular thing, it's like these people. Uh, that are being marketed to maybe they went to school for similar things to begin with didn't get off in their field went off and did something else and now because of the coronavirus their new career has been thrown into jeopardy they're emotionally vulnerable questioning everything they're probably economically vulnerable looking for a way out of their or a way to pad at least their current circumstances if not get out entirely Mm -hmm. and then they have this guy who's like i can teach you how to do what you were trained to do in college, but for some reason failed, and I'm going to get you to make like 10 grand a month. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, that's my passion, number Mm -hmm. one. And number two, who can say no to 10 grand a month? It almost sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it is. It's such a huge number to start off on. That's nuts. But that's what he says. That's nuts. 10 grand a month? No way. Who the fuck's making 10 grand a month? Him. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's all. I wonder if even that's a lie. Is he actually making that much money, or is he making enough money to rent fancy cars and make make it seem like he's actually making a lot of money? I honestly believe he's, his his income is probably in the hundreds of thousands, hmm. maybe the low hundreds of thousands, but the hundreds of thousands nonetheless. Hmm. Still immensely successful, given the fact he's selling false hope to people. Yeah, like that's amazing. Think about this, people. Before you fall into something like this, is how many people need to be engaged in this project for this man to be making that money? There are a lot of people. If you're one of those people who got sucked into it, you shouldn't feel bad. Like there's a good chunk of people out there who are falling for this. And the fucked up thing is, is that a lot of them are masquerading as legitimate businesses. Like I'm not to go into too much detail, but my sister, for example, she got herself in, she, she found an influencer on Instagram that happens to live in Asia. One of uh, a girl that I used, we both used to go to school with. Well, she's married over there. She's got mm-hmm. an Instagram business, right? And her Instagram business is selling these all natural Swiss products, like mm. like uh, s- disinfectants for your house and hand soaps and all this shit, right? Mm-hmm. On the surface, it's a really good product. 
right? Like okay. it, it makes it makes sense. Like the product is good, so you don't feel like you're being sucked into anything when you're actually, yeah, you know what? This is a good idea. But she has two young kids. Is it a real product? It's a real product. Okay. It, it works, but the business model is such. And I re- remember we were talking about the leggings. Uh, what's mm-hmm. the leggings company? The one that make the colorful leggings for women. Oh, oh man, Lou, Lou, yeah. Lou, it's Lou something. Lou. It's, it's the Lululemon knockoff. Yes. Okay. So what's happening here? There's two things that are happening here. So their entire business model is Instagram, mm-hmm. right? And they rely on people using their user base to reach out to other people to sell their products, mm-hmm. right? Each of the boxes that that company sells you retail for X amount of dollars. That's if you follow the exact script, selling every product by the book in time. That's how much you can expect to make. And it looks like a, a reasonable profit on paper. The first problem is you're never going to sell your products in the time frame that they're telling you. So the products are hanging around. They're costing you more, right? They're cutting into your profits. The second thing is because ev- their, entire, uh, sh- uh, their entire market base is Instagram-based. They are a multi, they're a social media company. That's mm-hmm. what they are. What happens is you have a bunch of these women who all bought into the same thing. And in order to actually make any money off of it, what they actually end up doing is undercutting each other on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So now you're selling the products at a loss to yourself just to sell them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the end of the month, the box of products they sold, brought you, they gave you the formula. You couldn't possibly follow the formula. It's virtually impossible to actually make that work. Right. And that's where your profits are. Mm -hmm. And then you look at how much you actually made in the month and maybe you were selling $30 face cream. Uh, organic face cream for $15 because there were four other people trying to sell it at the same time <laughs> to the same group of people, right? The okay. same thing with the leggings, the, the, the Lou, Lou Remen. I can't fucking remember this company for some reason. It, that this is so close to Lou. Yeah. It's, it's so, like, it's such a knockoff. It's yeah. such a fucking sham, right? Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same business model that this company was, was perpetuating. It's mm-hmm. exactly the same thing. They would get, you would pay into it, uh, right up front, it's a, I believe it's like a five to seven hundred dollar initial package, and the package of all the leggings would come to you, right? Um, and you would have a formula for how you were going to turn this profit, and apparently you have to stick right to the formula. But what a, a lot of these uh, ladies were finding was that so there were certain leggings and certain sizes that are clearly more popular than others. Mm-hmm. Well, these people on the low level pyramid scheme, these people that were buying in at five and seven hundred dollars, they were getting all the undesirable patterns. They were getting all the undesirable fucking uh, sizes, mm-hmm. and they're forced to compete against their uh, their the people that are doing the same thing they are on the same platform. Mm-hmm. So they're undercutting each other just to sell their product, and at the end of the month, you actually end up operating at a loss while you're giving all your profits to the company. <laughs> It's fucking crazy. <laughs> but it's the same thing with Uber and Lyft. Like, I wish a lot of people would understand the business model here. You mm-hmm. are not hired by these companies. They are taking advantage of you. You, If you get hurt in the job, if you get into a car accident, they're not paying your bills. If you mm-hmm. have to pay repairs, they're not paying your shit. They are using you for your own property knowing full well that your desperation will not let you see past your day-to-day needs and allow you to take a long view of what you're doing in your life. Because if you were taking oh, yeah. a long view of what you were doing in your life, you would do an assessment based on a six-month and a 12-month period, and you'd be like, well, you know what? With the oil changes and you know new tires and uh, you know uh, the maintenance, the normal maintenance because of the extra kilometers, I'm actually not making a cent. Mm-hmm. And people are... Like, I just don't get it. Uber is really crazy because, like, they don't... It's not like they reimburse you for the gas. Um, they don't pay for any of the maintenance on the car. No. When you sign up, they demand that you um, upgrade your insurance. Yes. Like, they're not paying you to do that. No. No. Yeah. No, yeah they're, they're doing absolutely nothing. And then, then, like, how much of the fare do they actually take? It's, like, 99% of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's like a, I don't know. I don't want to put, I don't want to put words in the Uber business model. My guess is it's something like 80, 20. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, most drivers are left relying on tips. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking about a younger generation. Which most people don't do. Yeah. You're talking about a younger generation of people. Like the idea of tipping is going the way of the dodo bird, essentially. I'm sorry. Yeah. If there's one criticism I have of the new generation, they're not, it's not like. Especially no, these days. Like how many people actually have money to tip? That's the other part of it. Not a lot of people That's the other part to. of it. So while I do blame them to a certain extent for 
not following convention because, uh, you know, the people that serve you every day are notoriously underpaid. At the same time, those same people are still underpaid right now. So, you know, catch 22 of the current economy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you rely on the generosity of others up until the point when they can't afford to be generous anymore, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Uber falls victim to that huge. But you can see what you can see, like Uber revealed itself for what it was during the infancy of the COVID-19 crisis, right? They were not willing to lose any money. They were not willing to keep around any of their additional personnel or contractors worried that they would somehow collectivize and, you know, come back to the company and get them somehow monetarily. So what they did was they ended up laying off like 70% of their drivers. Hmm. Like literally just sending them a note a couple months ago saying, uh, you know, we're terribly sorry. You no longer work for us. Thank you. Now imagine that after a 0% commitment, technically it's, it's an ignorant move to even send you a letter given that they've divested every bit of inf- interest in you and all they want is your profit and they don't want your bullshit. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't want your car maintenance. They don't want your insurance. They don't want your, you're yep. responsible for all of this, including your own safety because you're picking up fucking strangers. God knows what I, I'm sure oh, the, yeah. I'm sure the worst of the worst stories are really, really bad. Right. Mm-hmm. They range from like rape to murder. I'm certain of it. Right. Mm-hmm. But this is what you get with an unregulated platform that only cares about money. Mm-hmm. Security costs money. Infrastructure to uh, improve driver safety costs money. Unionization costs money. Counting somebody as a real employee of your company costs money. Taking a vested interest in the personal property that you're using to turn your profits costs money. Mm -hmm. Uber is a fucking crooked, corrupt fucking model of a company. And these are all shell corrupt companies. All of these, I mean, as much as I hate to admit it, even certain elements of Airbnb. You know, and I've been guilty of using them in the past. But these mm. Silicon Valley companies, they're all the, the, the very the, the foundation for which their companies are built on are, is corruption, is taking advantage of people at their most vulnerable moments. Mm-hmm. That's that's the new economy. That's that's the if yeah, Air, Airbnb is an interesting one. Like, I wonder how much money people are actually making. I honestly don't know. That. I don't know. I want to believe like it was always my belief that. There was a certain inherent good in the business model of Airbnb, and that was that it connected me with somebody local mm-hmm. that where I was going, wherever I was going, and that person could provide me with something that would be valuable in terms of like either local area knowledge or just mm-hmm. there, or I was just directly supporting somebody that wasn't a hotel. Yeah. Because, you know, you, me, and everybody else out there probably looks at hotels. They're 90% unoccupied right now, but they're still charging the same rates per night. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can clearly afford to operate at a loss, but you don't want to reduce your prices to make your consumers happier. So, you know what? That's that's the uh, grave robber mentality of of many corporations in the economy. The airlines are the same way. You would think that they would be reducing prices on people who are still willing to travel through the air, mm-hmm. but they're actually doubling down and they're charging people more. They're punishing yeah. us for COVID nineteen. They're saying, "Fuck you. We're not incurring any of the losses for what's happening. It's going to be your fault." And isn't that just convenient? And yeah. and pretty much every time something fucked up in the economy happens, whether it's the 07, 08 global financial crisis, they absol- the, the corporations absolve themselves of the debts, shove it down the throats of the taxpayer, push it back on the books, and then eventually, you know, the chicken comes home to roost. It's the, it, the taxpayer is on the line for it. So, mm-hmm. you know, when corporations are used to an environment where they're allowed to get away with everything that they do that's morally culpable – in, you know, like morally reprehensible, um, and they realize they don't have to suffer any repercussions for it. Not the corporation itself, nor the people who make the decisions. What's the what's the impetus to make good decisions? It's true. <laughs> you That's know? true. There's nobody holding you accountable anymore. Mm-hmm. So you know, whatever. Yeah, it's really weird what's going on right now, in particular, like when you mentioned um, airlines doubling down on their on their ticket sales. Like it's it's amazing how nobody's really trying to fix any problems right now. No. Everyone's just kind of going by as as if everything's normal. Yeah, they're all just trying to forget <laughs> that that life is like going to shit real quick. Yeah, yeah. I'm, Even with these uh, stimulus checks, the government's given out. Everyone's just like, hey, you know, we were making that joke earlier. Like, just take the stimulus check, shut up, stop asking questions. <laughs> like. <laughs> It's like, that's what it feels like. Like, it is, yeah. people are in this weird dystopia right now. Yes. Yeah. 
where nothing really matters. Nothing matters. Everything's in limbo, and nobody actually knows when it's going to end. I or if it's ever going to go back to normal. I don't, I don't think it's going to go back to normal. I don't think they've they've gone far enough to telling us whether that will be the case or not. I don't see it being... Um, I see there being a, a point where things will feel like they return to normal, but people will still have this feeling out process societally. But I think, you know... Like, you got to remember right now, we're in a process of erasing history throughout our entire society. How am I tying this in, Neil? You're crazy. I know. I get it. Okay. This will be forgotten much as the rest of history is now being forgotten. It will either be erased or we'll just completely forget it. And once we do so, we're bound to repeat the same mistakes. Mm. Right? We're bound to go back to normal. We're bound to return to our full sense of security that everything's normal. It might take three to five years. Mm -hmm. But people cognitively, collectively will forget, right? They forgot about SARS. They for, they forget. They forget about everything. That's true, right? The Black Plague, the Spanish Flu, the fuck that never changed. At, how much did that really actually change? <clears throat> After about a decade, people were like, "Ah, fuck it, everything's cool." <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like really. It's not like people were walking around wearing masks after the Spanish flu 10 years later. No, they forgot. Yeah. It's only during times of crisis like now that we revisit the previous crises and only as a point of comparison to the current situation. True. Right. So we're, we're at a strange point right now of trying to compare COVID to like things that took down like half of the world's natural population at a time when they were circulating. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not a fair comparison. Uh, to what's going yeah. on right now. I'm sorry. The response is, the response has been, to be blunt, I mean, and, you know, maybe rightfully so, maybe wrongfully so, but it's been overreactionary. It's, For sure. It's been overreactionary, that's, right? That's painfully clear. There has been no disease I can remember in my lifetime, and certainly I believe, you know, maybe 100 years previous that shut down the entire global market. Mm -hmm. right shut down entire countries where like my coworker was joking with me the week before we left the office that you know oh china was taking all these measures to like lock people in their houses and shit like that it's like could you ever imagine like democracies doing that i'm like you know safe of like welding somebody into their house yeah i could and then like yeah, a, and then I mean, like a month did. later <laughs> yeah <laughs> then like a month later yeah. there we were yeah right so like what was ludicrous before became fully conceivable during this time mm -hmm. but you know just to put things into perspective though like just the last point here we're not battling you're you're being made to feel like w what this is is something a lot more serious than it is um mm -hmm. i personally this is my opinion Okay, it's not like scientific fact or anything, but by the time this is all said and done, I think what we probably should have done was double down and focus on diseases that are killing a lot more people a lot more frequently every day. Mm -hmm. That that's that's the truth. Like you'll hear stories right now of entire cancer wards uh, being converted to COVID wards and cancer patients having to wait like four to six weeks for a fucking CAT scan. That's not right. That's a disproportional response. And mm -hmm. if you really looked at killers in the context of how many people actually get affected by them, I'm pretty sure cancer would take a precedent over COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then when those cancer patients pass away they'll claim it as a covid death absolutely which is actually happening that's right yeah that's right yeah they're Go. claiming everything as a covid death because because i mean if if you're already if you already have a disease like cancer your, your immune system is weakened so yeah you could get you could get covid very easily yep. <clears throat> and then if you pass away they just say well he had covid so yep. that's covid death yep but not saying that, you know, but you what, already had a pretty serious fucking disease yeah. beforehand. Why, why, what is your number one reason that you think that that they would, they would take that angle as opposed to simply trying to iron out the complexities of like, yeah, you know what, this guy was battling like this and this and this, which made him very, very receptive to anything. And then this came along and why do you think it's being, why do you think the narrative's being rearranged to be like, you know, Oh no, he was he was a perfectly normal cancer patient and then COVID came along and bam. <laughs> I think it fits probably for two reasons. It fits the government's narrative of of uh it justifies what they're doing right now. Okay. You know, if you actually looked into it and seen how many people 
who had diabetes and then got COVID and then died, or then who, who people who were obese then got COVID then died, or people who had cancer that got COVID then died. If you actually started to see the actual what's actually happening here, I think the actual COVID deaths would be almost zero. Yeah, you know, a lot less. Yeah, than they're actually saying. So it would make what uh, it would make all these lockdowns unjustifiable. But I also think there's a, there's an incentive for for doctors and hospitals to claim more more uh, in the United more, more COVID deaths in the United States. There is I don't, in, in the states. I, what, what do you think the motivation sure. would be? What do you think the motivation would be in Canada? In uh, Canada, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, they're getting they're getting funding, so maybe uh, it's an interesting question. So maybe if there's a, there's a certain hospital that has way more COVID deaths than another one. What do you, uh, what do you, what do you, you think? Know, some, you, somebody would say, well, that, that hospital clearly needs more funding. What do you think, you know? what do you think uh, buries itself uh, deeper in the imaginary of the average human being? Is it the, the number of people that die, or is it the percentage of people that die based on how many people overall had been affected? Which number, which number tweaks people more? Is it the pure the num- o- yeah? The is it the overall or? people that have died, or is it the percentage of people that have contracted it that have died? Which one are people more fixated on, in your opinion? Um, I don't know. I think it's percentage. I, I, I think, think it's percentage. Percent? I don't think people are looking at it in the context of how many people. Well, have anybody actually died. anybody who has actually seen the overall deaths, um, will quickly realize that it's not even close to the amount of deaths. That people get from the flu, yeah, every year. Yeah, I know. Like it's not the same. Yeah, it's crazy. It's not even close. Well, you're not allowed to say that. Like technically, yeah. that puts you in the rogue area, and then yeah. they're gonna say, you know, you know, who the fuck are you to say? And by know, the way, that's even less than malaria. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which has just never gone away. But what if? What if? <laughs> and no, nobody talks about ever. That's right. It's not the fad, mm-hmm. and it doesn't affect enough white people. True. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm multifactorial there Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but if it was by percentage for example just if the if it was the percentage of of people that died versus how many people contracted and you know we're sitting at like what i don't know because i was hearing this argument really early on it's like oh no it's a really deadly virus it claims like 12 percent of the people that it infects or affects or something like that Mm -hmm. and this is before all the testing measures came in and everything like that Mm -hmm. so it got me looking at uh, some of the most most lethal diseases on the planet. Mm-hmm. And there are diseases on this planet that if you are infected with them will kill you 99% of the time. <laughs> I believe it's mm-hmm. dengue fever. Not like No, it's not. It's not dengue fever. I can't remember. Mosquito-borne uh, parasites, especially in tropical areas, yep. some of them have like a 95 to 99% kill rate. It's fucking that's crazy. how serious it is this, yeah, this is yeah, what yeah. we're talking about because i was having this conversation with people a lot when this first started like oh it's just such a lethal disease it claims like 12 percent of the people that are infected by it. it's like listen you need to put this in context okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> you yeah, yeah. you need to you need to realign yourself and figure out what 12 percent means in the context of <clears throat> uh, uh communicable diseases that's mm. very very low mm. um and by that standard, and we're still finding right now by percentage, this percentage keeps going down. That's because they're identifying mm-hmm. more cases vis-a-vis the deaths, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, like, it's just, like... Yeah, so it's not the same at all. But, like, I, I guess with some people might have <clears throat> the immediate fear that it's because it's 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 human-to-human uh, transmitted, right? Right. Whereas you might not be as worried about malaria or something like that because it's, you you would have to be bit by a mosquito. It's not like you can cough on somebody and, and then they all of a sudden they have malaria. Um, same with like rabies. Like if you get rabies, you're going to die. Yeah. There's no cure for it. That's right. But nobody's fucking scared of rabies. Well, I take I take the other uh, approach to that. I'm actually more fearful of the mosquito than I am of uh, my fellow man. Yeah. I really, I really am. I've traveled mosquitoes, to some of the mosquitoes are fucking you can't, you, you Zika, can't, you cannot, uh, you will never be able to protect yourself and every ounce, uh, every part of your body mm-hmm. from a mosquito that's determined to suck you. Mm-hmm. You'll never do that. Especially if you're somewhere tropical where you like, you're not going to be covered up. Hell no. <laughs> no, you're, yeah, it's, you can't, yeah, like, you're, you know, you're reducing yeah. yourself to the minimalist in terms of clothes, mm-hmm. right? Cause it's 40 degrees outside plus humidity. 
mm-hmm. and maybe rain even uh, like <laughs> yeah, yeah no and yeah the mosquitoes are rich <laughs> everywhere dude you know like it's uh mm-hmm. yeah so yeah and off can only do so much off is not an option there it's not it's just not strong enough (laughs) you need to if you're if it's something that you're really really worried about you get vaccinations before you go essentially (laughs) right um yeah i think it's mandatory right Uh, no yeah you you have to get the malaria shot right no but i can see through this whole covid thing this becoming something that will require some sort of mandatory assessment both on Mm. your home side and on your point of uh, travel um Talking about the COVID vaccine? No, I'm once talking. I'm talking about testing once, uh, you know, once they, you know, once travel starts oh, to resume yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. They'll, like, they'll test. Yeah, it's you know, or they'll at least do the um, laser to the head thing. <laughs> the the fucking the temperature. That thing can see right through me. Right through the brain. It knows my emotions. Right through the dome. It knows. It knows what I'm thinking. It connects with your neural link. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Elon. <laughs> Thanks, Elon. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Send me one of those SpaceX spacesuits, man. What are you doing, okay. Elon? <laughs> That's a blunder on his point. Man. I think. Well, you talk about it. The, what the? Uh, yeah. Neuralink? Oh yeah. yeah. Fuck yes. Fuck. Okay. Are you kidding okay. me? Man, Neuralink. Okay. Do people like some cybernetic chat. Like, do they? Oh my god, Neuralink is like one of the most dystopian things I've ever heard of, and I'm, I'm surprised it comes from Elon because he, he's always like he's so against AI. Yeah, yeah. For the, for obvious reasons, and yet he, do, he can't see a downside to this new invention that he's that he has. What is he not seeing, or what is he seeing that we're not seeing, or vice versa? I I don't know. I think what he's seeing with Neuralink, and by the way, Neuralink is um, it's it's this device that has to be uh, surgically implanted into your brain. Man. So they actually developed a a robot that will do this surgery. Uh, because you can't have a human do this because it would just it, it, it's a it's it's a pin that has little threads and it shoots those threads into different nodes mm-hmm. in very specific spots in your brain so that it can track your brain function um and you can't obviously you can't have a human do that because they would just like scramble you they would just lobotomize you if they actually <laughs> tried to tried to fucking do that kind of thing um but yeah it's it's implanting these nodes so that you can track like your brain waves on an app, Ugh. and the way he <laughs> describes it is like, well, you know, it'll it'll shoot like electrical pulses to certain spots in your brain, so that if you you know if you have like um, Alzheimer's or something like that, that you could potentially actually fix those problems in the brain because it's a brain disease. Man. I mean, it's pot- potential. I mean, it, it there there's no human being that has this yet. No, so it's all hypothetical. And but he's also saying, like, maybe even for paralyzed people, you could actually Ooh. make their legs work again because it's all in the brain. Isn't this just part of the whole marketing program where we're going to go full steam ahead with all the great things and the great potentiality yeah, that this yeah. thing has? But let's not talk about any of the potential downfalls or like what led mm-hmm. Google to become Google or Facebook to become Facebook or Amazon to become Amazon. Mm-hmm. Let's just go full steam ahead. This is the greatest thing that was ever invented. Don't question it. If you do, you're a detractor. <laughs> like who who gets to decide how this operates yeah really. and what about updates yeah like well, we what, talked what, about what we talked about this? earlier now now you've got a neural link in your head like mm-hmm. uh is this susceptible to being hacked 100 percent, it will be yeah it's connected to an app on your phone and we're, like well your your phone is hackable we're talking about the com- apps apps always have <clears throat> back doors like we're and we're talking about companies that are notoriously irresponsible with people's data I mean, if you're like me, not a single year goes by that your credit card company isn't sending you a message or your bank or, you know, your credit score company or, you know, one of the, you know, many sites that you've given certain small bits of information to once a year without fail, I'm getting like a disclaimer saying, uh, you know, we just noticed based on an audit that your information has been compromised and there's always this line that says, but don't worry, none of your personal information is compromised. No, that's not what mm-hmm. you're telling me. You're telling me that there was a data breach. You don't know what was breached mm-hmm. because you didn't give a shit until now. Now you give a shit. Now you're going to be retroactive. All this infrastructure to uh, preserve the integrity of people's information, it costs way too much money. These companies love to make money. They don't like to spend money where they don't want to spend money. 
if there's a reason why there's a data breach with your uh um you know your credit reporting company could you imagine like mm-hmm. your credit score theoretically is one of the most important numbers that you carry around with you your entire life mm-hmm. these companies are collecting very sensitive data off you they they they've got they've got lots of information about you lots of sensitive information to be so negligent as to not give a shit about people's security until after the fact and then send me some bullshit email that's supposed to tie a bow around my feelings and make me feel good for the like if you were that competent this would have never happened don't give me this rosebud email with a fucking bow mm-hmm. tied around it telling me how you know oh there was a data breach but don't worry none of your really sensitive information was and don't worry we fixed it now i don't give a fuck I don't fucking yeah. care. That's besides the point. Don't you fucking idiots understand that? Like, do, do you not understand that the that the action is the breaching of the equipment? It's not you apologizing to me and reassuring me that now you're looking after it. I don't give a shit. You know, the person who really could hurt me has already got my information, and you're just saying, fuck you. We're, mm. You know, we, we collected all this information, and we really used it for our own profits, but you know what? It kind of got screwed over at some point. Um, you know, we're not willing to do anything about it, um, but we'll we'll tell you we're sorry and we'll do better in the future. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Give me a break. None of these companies can actually guarantee that things aren't going to get stolen at some point. Cybernetic implants and mm-hmm. third party users inside your brain. Now you mm-hmm. can take take what was just said and apply it to this concept of having third parties inside your head. Mm-hmm via nano threads mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's scary shit if a hacker gets in we just fuck your brain we right talked up. about this like are we connected now at that point to the internet of things yeah well all of this is in preparation of 5g right when it gets rolled out right are we are, are we it's all it's all about like that bandwidth everything's gonna get faster and more extreme does a cybernetic implant automatically connect via wi-fi to my toilet to my sto- oven stove, it could. To I my mean, fridge to my thermos, Google Nest thermos. Does it automatically now con- connect me to the Internet of Things mm-hmm. just because I want a little bit of enhanced stability as a human being? Is that a trade off I have to make now? You could easily connect it to uh, your your Google Home or something like that. You could definitely connect it that way. Um, the way Elon describes it is that. With with this, if enough people have Neuralink, you wouldn't have to talk. You could just be, beam your thoughts to someone else's brain. Can I be the first and he's one like, to say? He's like, we're five years away from not talking anymore. And it's like, what the fuck? Can I but be the first that's, one to that's say? That's Elon, the guy that said 10 years ago, we're going to go to Mars in five years. Can I be the first one to, 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 to just remark about how fucking incredibly stupid that idea is? It's insane. It's not insane. It's stupid. Could you imagine? <laughs> yeah, like, could you imagine a that? desirable outcome being that there is zero verbal communication between human beings? Could you imagine that being a desirable outcome? I don't know who that benefits. Oh, fuck! I can't even begin to tell you. Mm-hmm. If they can just tap into your neural link and intercept your uh, reception between two people that are having a conversation, and just be mm-hmm. like, "Oh no, we don't agree with the content of your conversation." Yeah, it's your neural link has now been cut off, but you don't know how to talk to anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. So are you a prisoner in your own head? Yeah. What a fucking joke. Yeah. What a fuck. This guy, we're allowing people like this to go around the world and tell people what they think the future looks like. A guy who took a concept that's 35 years antiquated put a fucking 18 inch tablet in the console and claims to be some sort of fucking revolutionary. It's mm-hmm. embarrassing that people like this are deified in our current society. It's amazing. They're not changing anything. They're not doing anything of any benefit. Their ideas are outlandish and asinine yeah. and don't seem to benefit anybody in particular. And if they took the ideas that they're espousing to their logical conclusions, if they were logical at all, these people, Mm. they'd be like, this is fucking ridiculous. Well, it's all part of the the futurist movement, right? 
there's there's tons of these people. They're they're world billionaires, and they're all just trying to reconstruct the utopia that we're all going to live in 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 thirty years. Well, you, you know, the, the, Ray Kurzweil, you know that well, guy. That guy's fucking insane. Okay, but there's a good distinction that needs to be made here. There's two. There's a there's a utopia for certain mm. people, certain users of the system. Right, mm-hmm. the, the the cream of the crop, so to speak. Well, I say utopia, ironically, obviously. Well, no, it's it stands to reason that you need to make a distinction between the fact that, like, or, or otherwise, what you're saying is, why would this group of people want to drive the entirety of society into a dystopia? Well, mm-hmm. it wouldn't be dystopian for them. That's True. that's the the goal is to to create. Um, you know, they've already created two tiered systems and everything else, right? You got a two tiered economy mm. where you know you and me are fighting uh, against each other in a capitalist all against all system uh, to market ourselves, and then you've got the rich who are uh, practicing socialism via the redistribution of wealth from the bottom to the top, mm-hmm. right? You've got a fully uh, immersive law system with a legal system and judges on our level that are going to hold us accountable for stealing a loaf of bread. But you've got a completely dysfunctional, almost non-existent system for CEOs of massive corporations like, you know, I don't know, Enron, Bank of America, who've shown themselves to literally, their their poor decision making has led to the the essential, you know, implosion of our economy, so to speak. And not a single person has ever been tried or tested for that Mm -hmm. right so it's no different with this when they're when you're Mm -hmm. talking about it's like yeah they're creating a dystopia for you and i Mm -hmm. right Uh, more so than it already is which is in the the sake of progress essentially i don't okay that's a whatever progress means to these people progress means uh no no uh no talk back to the Mm -hmm. mechanisms of control Mm -hmm. no uh no formalized collective response Mm-hmm. And you can see that in the way that things are playing out right now. Like, it's really hard to even... Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Like, you're on Twitter right now. You can read somebody's tweet, and you can instantly hate them without even knowing who they are or even mm-hmm. talking to them because they represent a different opinion on a certain subject than you do. And this is as easy as it is to keep people divided now. Right? Yeah. Right? And then we're all we're all finding trying to find our information that we want to know uh, through our mutually reinforced groups of, you know validation right like you're on youtube and and you're only being fed videos from progressive lefts leftists and uh progressive leftist news so you're led to believe that you know this populist movement is like a lot bigger than it is even Mm -hmm. though in reality youtube is really just using its algorithm to channel you into a silo where you only integrate yourself with like-minded individuals and you learn to disdain everybody else who doesn't believe what you believe Mm-hmm. it's creating cults yeah. it's creating cults it really does it just it force feeds you what you want that's right yeah right and a lot of people- i notice it all the time yeah. like you, if you're on youtube for long enough like start a new youtube account today uh watch four videos of whatever you want to watch and then you will be just force fed more videos on those topics or those those, those particular channels for the rest of your time on YouTube, yeah. like it's it's really hard to get out of that algorithm. You know the ones you really got to try yeah. to to get out yeah. of it. Like you know, may, maybe spend four days only looking up uh, cat videos. You know to try you, to undo yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. but like uh-huh. it's fucking weird how it works. You know what I don't what I don't like about the about the algorithm is it it makes these other assessments based on the stuff that you're watching. So like. You could be watching a video, uh, could be an independent documentary about the inner machinations of Wall Street. And then you look at your feed on the right-hand side and it's like, you know, it's this dude giving a seminar in this second-rate college in somewhere in Mississippi about, you know, the presence of aliens and all this shit. It's like, you mm-hmm. literally are make that's literally, you're trying to psychologically discourage me from looking at this video by equating it to some fucking kook in a second rate college talking about aliens and how they're walking amongst us. That's what you're trying to do to me. Mm. You're trying to make me think based on this says recommended for me. How did it, how was it recommended for me? It didn't have anything to do with the video I was just watching, but they're looking at that. They're like, Oh, this guy is just susceptible to truth. So what Mm. they do, their your first video on the right hand side is going to be some asinine thing to make you believe like now what you're actually watching currently is probably equatable to this 
kook who's talking about how aliens are walking among us somewhere in a second rate college in mississippi interesting yeah for sure did you watch that video i would never what was that i'm just giving a um pertinent example oh. of uh you know how how the algorithm yeah it's not it's not uh giving you that video recommendation based on your previous viewing it's actually doing that as a psychological barrier to you going down a hole where you're learning a bunch of facts and information about how something mm-hmm. really works. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So this happens to me all the time. You know, I watch a lot. I, I take in a lot of information. Some of it's definitely detrimental to the, the, at least the business partners of Google mm-hmm. undoubtedly. And some of it, I could see Google trying to go out of its way to discourage me from actually going down that show hole by equating the videos that I'm watching to something that's completely ridiculous. Hmm. As if to tell me, by the way, what you're watching right now, it's as ridiculous as what we're recommending for you. That's why we recommended it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, and I run into that a lot because I hmm. do this. I'll do this left, right, center thing. Like there's an issue. It's like left, right, center, left, right, center, left, right, center. You can't, you okay. can't do anything. You can't form an opinion on anything if you're not taking in information that is not palatable to you or you don't like it. Right. If you're not doing that, then you're not taking in all the undesirable information. You're putting yourself in a silo. Right. Mm -hmm. Because really, it's not that that information is not pertinent. You just don't see it as being valuable to you because you've already formed an opinion on something. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I I wouldn't dare. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck fuck that. No way. Mm -hmm. That happened. That happens to me a lot on uh, social media. No doubt about it. That happens to everybody now. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. What you're saying is the the problem with social media right now. So, what do you think? What what would you think would be the oddest thing? Like, you've watched a video that was a little bit contra, and you know, have you ever had any weird recommendations just kind of pop up on the right hand side? Uh, no, nothing weird. Wow, I haven't gotten any. I haven't gotten any random stuff. You are a YouTube puritan. Uh, How do you get away with all this? I don't know. Like, what is it? Just all guitar videos? and Watching all the right shit, I guess. Fuck. Yeah, well, you would think just watching Joe Rogan alone, you'd be susceptible to some of these nonsense advertisements and shit. Well, I get crazy advertisements for all, all, all sorts of crazy shit. Yeah. You know? Well, but that's, that's, that, <laughs> that comes with it, you know? If you're watching something like the Joe Rogan experience, you're going you're gonna to get stuff for, like, random psychedelics and otherworldly shit. On YouTube. Yeah. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. <clears throat> yeah. I can't believe it would actually go that far. Oh, yeah. That's it's, a- always, it's always like <laughs> content about psychedelics and shit like that or ball trimmers. Oh, you know? man. <laughs> one of the two. Is that one of his advertising partners? I don't think so. Really, eh? I don't think so. I think, I think the algorithm knows a lot of men watch it, so it's like clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah, we can sell some ball trimmers. Plus, plus, again, you know, like there's a good percentage of men that are working from home. They're kind of just like, Mm -hmm. you know, self grooming right now. They're just kind of going Mm -hmm. through the motions. You know, what a perfect time to drop an ad about uh, a a tool that's going to help you get back in the game, Mm -hmm. right? You've given your man. They've like, uh, I see ads for that all all fucking day, like all day, every day. They must be making a lot of fucking money. The Duluth Underwear Company. Duluth. The Underwear Company, yeah. yeah. Hold your balls in place <laughs> while you're doing whatever it is you're doing, jumping jacks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Secures your balls. <laughs> while, while you're while you're doing Me jumping undies. jacks or backflips. Me undies. You ever heard of that one? Nope. Mm. Nope. I still want to find out. I, another one. I still want to remember the name of that leggings company, dude. Uh, search it up. You know what? Fuck it. For the for figure the, it out for the sake of uh, um, you know the disgusting thing about that is that it's so close to Lululemon like it's just and a di- it's a direct ripoff the product like they know what they're doing the products are so inferior too look at this they I mean, don't have to I just be put good. on I just put on YouTube it's set a bedtime reminder get a reminder when it's time to stop watching and go to bed people have lost <laughs> all control they've lost in it, 10 in 10 years it's going to be like set a urinary reminder let google remind you when it's time to take a piss so you can be reminded to put down your phone and not piss your pants in bed yeah 
is that where we're going with this? Is and that then, what- and then one day, like the the uh, yeah, the notifications are going to start getting more blunt. Like, hey, idiot, we know you're fucking stupid. <laughs> Do what we say, Ugh. or Google Home is going to give you a little shock. That fucking drives me nuts. <laughs> That absolutely drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like mm-hmm. I can't. I can't. I can't simply just stand Lula Row. Lula Row. Lula Row. Any woman that's listening that's so that knows anything about this, if you come across this, drop a comment. Let us know if you know anybody <laughs> who's ever been involved with this, or if you were involved with this personally. It would be awesome to have you on the show to talk about it. That would be interesting. You know. Mm-hmm. Start start dropping comments and then have people uh, on the show based on their experiences and stuff like that. And I guarantee you there's a lot of nightmare information. There's probably tons of people out there. It is so bad. And you know what? You know what the problem is with a business model like LuLaRoe? Um, not only are these women emotionally vulnerable, uh, some of them are economically vulnerable, but you know, a lot of them are like single mothers or stay at home mothers. And they're looking to create a, you know, a second pathway to income and stuff like that. And they're thoroughly convinced that, you know, this is one of the legitimate ways to go, but without doing your homework in advance, you wouldn't know what you were getting yourself into. Right. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've like, I mean, we've said it so many times tonight. It's like, can you trust the average consumer to be smart enough to do advanced uh, research to find out what's right for them? You know, like what, you know, the, nope. the, the Apple <laughs> computers example mm-hmm, that we yeah. brought up earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, if you wanted to buy a $2,000 Apple, that's fine for you. But, uh, you know, $2,000 is a lot of money. It's not, it's not an emotional decision. It's a financial decision that can impact you if you don't make the right one. You owe it to yourself to do the research to figure out if that product is right for you or not. Mm-hmm. Not endorsing or unendorsing any product, just simply stating a fact. Right. Right. That's $2,000 you ain't going to get back if you make the wrong choice. So think about that. Mm-hmm. Right. It depends on what you, you want it for. <clears throat> like when I, bought, when I bought my MacBook, this is, this is a really old MacBook too. It was like 2012. Yep. Now when I bought this, it was... Uh, like I, I, I picked it out specifically for what I needed it to do. Um, but over the years, those needs have changed, right? So it's like yeah. we're recording a podcast on it right now. It's not the it's it does not have the processing to s- speed for like editing and shit like that. It overheats all the fucking time. Like the RAM is shit. Well, that those, you know, those it's, models it's of obsolete. Apple's they did they didn't come with uh, really uh, high quality built in fans, so they can't no, no, dissipate no. heat very well. No, that's one of the downfalls brutal. of the model. Like if, like again, you bought it for a reason. You needed it for certain things. But like a lot mm. of people, they may they may look at that and they may like, oh yeah, you know what? I like to game on it and whatever, and didn't do the research knowing that that fan is not adequate for the amount of uh, not uh, made for that. That's right. Mo- your your base model MacBook is only usable for uh, surfing the internet. Really, that's, that's very it. handy. Mm-hmm. I could use my original iPhone to do that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you can't really do anything with a Mac like a standard MacBook. That's kind of a tragedy, though. Mm-hmm. They charge a lot of money for these things. These are not they do. cheap investments. For you people. pay for the experience. <sighs> Can you explain the? But I'm saying like there's so many people that buy MacBook Airs right now. But I'm gonna tell everybody right now: if you buy a MacBook Air, it is just an iPad (laughs) with a keyboard attached to it. Oh Jesus! Nothing, nothing internally is different. What's the retail on that? Oh, it's. I I think the the start is thirteen hundred, maybe. That's that's insane. For MacBook Air. You know, you got uh, you got the. uh, you got the tablet keyboard combos that are being sold for four ninety nine, with processing power that's rough. No. Well, that's roughly equal to that MacBook that you're paying thirteen hundred bucks for. Yeah. So that's one of those decisions, like Luke was saying, that you need to consider, like what you need it for. If you're one of those people who just like needs a slightly advanced tablet, uh, you know, there's four hundred dollar options out there for you. If you're one of those people who buys into the lifestyle, the mm-hmm. Apple has lifestyle brand, and you really just can't do without it. Well, I guess you're paying the thirteen hundred, but you know mm-hmm. it's a le- it's a choice that you got to make for yourself, and don't regret it. That's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of money. You know. So. Yeah, as much as I love to talk shit about about Apple, um, the operating system is still smooth. 
It's it's still good. <laughs> Here we go. I, I still like it more than Windows, man. I don't like Windows at all. Windows fucking sucks, and I think most people hate it. But mm. but in in order to have better a better product, you have to go with Windows. Because you have way more options with PC than you do with a yeah yeah. You know, but the, app, Apple products are a closed off system, so there's there's only so much you can actually do. Well, you know, I think maybe one of the biggest mistakes they made was taking that closed off system and applying it to their cell phones and shit too. Like, you couldn't mm. make a bigger mistake, in my opinion, than having a product that lacks that connectability. You really mm-hmm. couldn't. I mean, you're 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 literally you're 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 doing you're taking all the right steps to lower your own business Mm -hmm. you really are especially especially nowadays like when apple was first starting to get big it was probably the the brand power of anything was probably driving all the decisions um especially when the iphone first came out i mean you had blackberry doing the exact same thing everything blackberry did was blackberry driven (laughs) I could, it I, wasn't compatible with anything else. Blackberry, but, but every phone was doing that. You know, if you had a fucking Motorola Razor, it was a fucking Motorola Razor. Black, like, that's Blackberry it. had that added conditionality that that uh, um, you know emissaries, uh, high high dignitaries of of governments and uh, government leaders just loved that mm-hmm. that analog ability to to maintain an ironclad security gate around all communication mm-hmm. which extended the shelf life of the blackberry for another 8 years after the concept of something like that became obsolete mm-hmm. right he still mm-hmm. had these world leaders that were walking around with their blackberries the and shit like, there was some tacit understanding that the blackberry was simply better for encrypted communication <laughs> i don't know how much i don't know i don't, I don't know, know how, how true that, that is i don't know Right. I think it still is. That's still their. That's still what they're branded as. You can't. Where are they? I don't. I haven't seen a new BlackBerry in years. Are they still they don't making make, them? They don't make phones anymore. <laughs> they make they they make software. Ugh. There's a BlackBerry software. Apparently, they're supposed to be making a comeback. But um, I don't. I don't know. I I've don't. I've heard good things. That oh, the come the, come the new the future of BlackBerry looks pretty good. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want to invest in it. You want to jump into the market at this point? I mean, you're you're supporting. You want the, to jump into it? I you, mean, you can get BlackBerry stock for like a dollar a share. You're supporting so, the you're supporting the last horse in the race. <laughs> Good work. Who is co- who is coincidentally shot in the leg prior to the race? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> came up a little. I don't know. Came I up think a it would be weird. really easy for them to make a new phone. Yeah, I think so. Something something more like an Android, but. They don't. They don't. Play. I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know why they wouldn't do that. Like some CEOs are just really fucking dumb, and and they can't. They can't see the long game. Yeah, I would. And think. BlackBerry just had one of those CEOs. One of those CEOs that just didn't understand the what was going to happen. Yeah, and they still didn't understand what a smartphone was, and they were still trying to play it. Maybe they just didn't have the technology to uh, produce a uh, legitimate competitive smartphone. Maybe. Right. Maybe not. Same thing with like, uh, it's pretty funny, like Nokia, for example, too. Like, they still have a large market in analog phones. You know? Like, yeah, you can buy them at gas stations. You don't see people hanging around with analog phones very much, but they're out there. <laughs> they're they're yeah. out there. Well, they're, they're burner phones. <laughs> well, I would, yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, they're perfect for your drug deals and your prostitution runs. Those sweet and... Nokia flip phones, man. Damn right. They're still out there. What about the slide phone? God, I love those. <laughs> the, the slide phone. The Motorola Razor. The Razor. You remember man. the Razor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, a yeah. lot of people have the Razor. Yeah. I start when I first started. When my first cell phone was a Nokia thirty three sixty. Okay. Oh, dude, this thing was old. Like when the first cell phone I ever got was like two thousand and. Four, three, mm. maybe even earlier. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, 1999, I believe, when I got my first cell phone. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Nokia. Th- Nokia 3360. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
It was just a piece of shit. Was it a flip or a brick? It was a brick. Okay. Chocolate bar phone. Yep. Bar phone. Chocolate bar yep. phone. Yeah, one of those. Right? Classic. And it had th- <laughs> three games on it, and the backlit right. screen would light up like, you know, yeah. iridescent green. And yep. you could just barely see the characters as you're playing on your you're playing your three games. Did you have that weird soccer game? I don't think I did. Fuck. Yeah. Those that might have been too fun. I don't think Nokia was really in the business of fun. <laughs> Not in the business of fun. Not in the business of fun. Just phone calls. We we were lucky enough to make a phone that worked. <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only real game on there is phone book. I was <laughs> contacts. <laughs> contacts. That's it. Yeah. I was uh, I was one of the pioneers of uh, text messaging though. Yeah. When I first started text messaging people, probably in early two thousand and shit, people still didn't have it figured out. Nobody would ever respond to your mm-hmm. text message when you would send one. Yeah, I remember this. This was so, there was like this text like nobody it was too difficult. Nobody wanted to adopt this new thing that was mm. you know it was it was a thing. It was coming. You yeah. know what I mean? But but a lot of people... But like, phones were obviously weren't optimized for that function. How many people times... People were still using them as actual phones. How many times I'd send a text message and shit, and then at like, in, in like the next minute just get a phone call? Be mm. like, yo, why the fuck are you texting me, man? So, My, how times have changed. Yeah. <laughs> now you get a phone call, and you're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, <laughs> just text me, you listen, asshole. I don't want to listen like, to your voice, you fucking idiot. <laughs> I want you to text me so I can ignore it for three hours and then text you back. And no, I don't have a BlackBerry, so you can't tell when I read your message. Because that's efficiency. (laughs) That's the future. This is the new wave. Yeah. (laughs) It's fucking stupid, actually. But but, uh, that's how people like to communicate. It's bad, but it's not. All text. It's not as bad as a neural implant that in 10 years will prevent all verbal communication amongst humans. Oh, I don't know. Like, like, does Elon Musk never have fucking bad thoughts? Does he think that, like, people reading his mind is okay? I think he's thinking that's probably pretty okay. Is he <laughs> is he like is he like married or anything? Like I don't think he has a family or anything. Yeah, he's know. married. Is he really? Yeah, he's got kids. Where do these guys find wives? On the internet. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I. No, uh, like you gotta, you fucking, gotta, you gotta think who's his, like who's his wife? His wife's pretty hot, actually. Like you gotta think though, like with the Bezos types and stuff like that. Like where where does a guy like Bezos? Like first of all, where does he find the time? Second of all, where does he find his wife? You know, on Amazon. <laughs> oh, yeah. A mail order Caucasian robot from fucking Alibaba. He's, he's, he's building his next wife with the, uh, the DARPA program. Oh. <laughs> she knows everything about everybody. So if you criticize her for being a robot, she just blackmails you. Oh. <laughs> She's also got the neural link. <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't get that. That's his enemy. No. He's battling Elon. Is he? Paul, oh, for what? For for the rights to private space enterprise? Global supremacy. I don't think Elon Musk is in that game. I don't know what his game is. I don't think it's global supremacy. If he did, he picked the wrong fucking market, in my opinion. You know, I'm sorry, but whatever you're doing right now that you think is innovative will probably be copied in Asia somewhere in the next 10 years and put out to the market for a quarter of the price. Then that'll be the end of that shit, and then and then Tesla will be a lifestyle brand, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> well, it, like it kind of already is, you know. Yeah, it is. It's it's literally it's supplanted the Prius for like I'm douchier than you status. Grimes. What the hell's that? That's her name. Grimes. Okay, so it's his girlfriend. It's not his. Uh... Yeah, she's all right. No, no disrespect. I mean, like I, they look like. A good, I guess she's a she's a singer. They look like a good couple. How about that? Yeah, he's on cloud nine. I guess she likes the money. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's kind of what it's all about nowadays. Okay, Elon's had like four fucking wives. You know, he can do whatever he wants. He's Larry King in it. Yeah. Somehow, somehow. Uh, we still give the privilege to a guy like Larry King, a fucking complete liberal hack, to go on air and tell us what he thinks, even though we already know what he thinks about everything because he's a liberal hack. I watched a Larry King thing today, actually, and... Uh, no innovative thought there anymore. No, he's just like, hey, so what's your deal? And then like, you, you just look at him, like, dying from the inside. Yeah, yeah, really, Like, really. His, his, the entire structure of his being is falling apart. What bothers me about these old, tired old pundits is that... Uh, as smart as they are, and I'm 
tend to believe that Larry King is a pretty smart dude. Like he's seen a lot. He's heard a lot. He's had a lot of good conversations with people, but the inability to see past your political disposition and this, uh, blame everything on Donald Trump and uh, deflect all criticism away from Barack Obama. And it's just, it gets sickening at a point. Like I can turn on Larry. I listen to the uh, first question. I already know what the answer is. Mm. Uh, You're a liberal hack. You don't get it. Every answer that you provide is not meaningful. It's void of any introspection or intellect because you're literally going to take it directly to where most people who know who you are, are going to take it. Is anyone looking to Larry King for answers, though? He's still on doing his show and shit. It's just that, no, I don't think they're looking to him for answers. I just think, like, you know, you're talking about uh, people who have inserted themselves in the political process, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, the type of... But I think the only reason why he's still doing his show is that, like, he refuses to retire. So he's he's still doing it, but it's probably not profitable. It's probably not... I think he's anything. Sca- I think he's scared to death, and he thinks the longer he's on television and and talking, the longer his life goes on. I I, I don't know. He's That's one probably of the, a good point. One of those people who thinks like as soon as he's I stop working, I'm dead. That's probably accurate for for him. <laughs> you know. I think that table is the only thing that's holding him up. Oh, like, it is. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoulders have sagged right down below the camera line. Oh God! It's, it's, like, it's and his his, his, his suspenders, suspenders are, basically don't are even. digging in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's fucking weird to look. <laughs> Oh, poor guy. But, you know, (laughs) like, it's time. Like, there's there's a time and a place for everything. And, like, his opinion of politics and, you know, um, the difference between the the liberal and the Republican Party is squarely rooted in, like, the late 60s, early 70s. These sort of, uh, um, you know... Um, part clear partitions between the philosophies of both party that simply don't exist anymore and you're left with a guy who's forced to come to terms with the fact that he's like a lifetime liberal but in reality the liberals are just as bad in the united states as the republicans arguably in some ways worse Mm -hmm. right and and the worst part about it is there's really no fundamental difference between either of the parties Mm-hmm. right like those those lines that used to exist in the stand the sand which made you a, a, a try hard liberal no longer exist anymore <laughs> that's right. not like everything that you stood for previously no longer applies mm-hmm. but he's still stuck there mm-hmm. he's still stuck there he's in the inability the incredible inability of smart people to be inward reflecting and even admit sometimes that they're like yeah you know i was probably wrong about that stuff hmm That's the hardest thing for people to do. I don't see a guy like Larry King. And, you know, what got us on this was like, you know, we're supposed to be taking guys like Larry King seriously, but he's had like fucking eight wives. Yeah. Like these people are bigots. They're not, they're not to be idolized. They're bigots. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, not only does anything you say not have any merit anymore, but like we shouldn't be listening to you anyways. By the current standards of cancel culture, you're a sexist and a mm-hmm. anti-feminist, and you should be... I wonder how many kids he's had. I don't fucking know. Like 100? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to lose any more respect for him than, than I've already lost because of his just senseless fucking pro-liberal rants. I don't care. You got to at least come into it from a neutral perspective. I mean, that's your goddamn job. Yeah. It's your goddamn job to at least make it seem like you're, you know in a sense, neutral to the material that you're presenting, but... Yeah, or at least, like, trying to have some kind of actual discourse. Yeah. Like, in, instead of just, like, hey, look at my suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> Trump Trump bad. Obama good. <laughs> orange man bad. Orange man bad. The orange race. <laughs> orange man. <laughs> the orange race is coming. <laughs> It's crazy. People like call him a fascist. Like I don't. No, no. Clearly, no, no. If you know anything about fascism, no, he's nowhere close. You know that's not what's happening here. He's a sensationalist who knows how to get his uh, support base riled up. I had a buddy try to convince me that uh, the states is a fascist nation Whoa. recently. Wow. And I'm like, you clearly don't know what fascism is. Jesus Christ! <laughs> like, it's very far from fascism. That's amazing. Yeah. 
but people don't know. People are people are fucking dumb. That's and the whole. They, they're th- just they're just saying whatever whatever comes to mind. See, in a nutshell, that's the essence of the point. Uh, our point of departure for this entire fucking podcast yeah. is that there's so many people out there that believe so many fantastical things. Almost none of them are right or accurate or factual. Mm-hmm. And to try to cut through the bullshit, so to speak, with like a knife and just kind of bring people back to a level plane to give people a platform that they can use a toolbox and a platform that they can use to start their journey on trying to find facts and truth through this goddamn fog that's been created uh, through misinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascism is definitely not the appropriate uh, uh, way I would describe the current political context of the United States. You're way overestimating the amount of power that the, the POTUS, the president of the United States has, if you think that it's a fascist country. Yeah, really? God damn. That oh, yeah. dude is not standing up there on his own volition, saying his own words, rowling a 78% majority of people and brainwashing them into thinking that, you know, there's a cult mm-hmm. and an ideology that's being, but there's none of, there's mm-hmm. none of the signs are there. It's, it's, he can't a, even tell, tell the states what to do. It's a, it's a fucking, it's a plutocracy. The United mm-hmm. States is a plutocracy. Okay. It's, it's owned and controlled, and the political system is owned and controlled by the people who own and control the means of production. It's a corporatist plutocracy is what it is. That's what the United States is right now. It's not a democracy. It's a corporatist plutocracy. You don't select your own leaders. You don't, as a, as a, a regular individual in society, have any influence whatsoever on how policy is formulated mm-hmm. at all. Right. I mean, there's there's actually research to show this too. I, I'd have to bring it up. Maybe we could bring it up on next week's show or whatever. But um, there's actually research to show just how much the the general populace has an effect on policy making in Washington at the national level. And they found something like only ten percent of the time to organic ground up social movements and grassroots organizations have any influence on policy decisions. The other 90% is basically reserved for the people who write the checks. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're wondering why you keep going out there and you keep peacefully protesting, but nothing ever gets done, you know, and you're one, and and I, maybe you're wondering too, why everybody's just becoming so violent all of a sudden. Well, peaceful protest is showing itself to be useless. It doesn't affect social change anymore. There's no 1960s, uh, you know, Martin Luther King fucking marching to Washington moments anymore. That's not, those times are gone, essentially. Right. And and the ability of those movements to have a direct impact on, like, I believe what John F. Kennedy said to Lu- Martin Luther King was, make me change the law by putting <laughs> enough pressure on the system that I had no choice but to do so. <laughs> right? right yeah that's the way it used to work yeah right and it wasn't just a, a forum for lobbyist organizations that were paid and bought and paid by corporations right it was uh it was an open forum for all interest groups to try to get their voices heard and it mm. seemed to me at least at that point you know post world war ii to probably like 1970 you know interest groups uh on grassroots interest groups had a lot more influence on on average policy than they do now because it's been reduced to pretty much nothing. Hmm. So the moral of that story is, I think, in my opinion, if you're not ready for a revolution that's anything but peaceful, I mean, go away somewhere until it's over, or join it and just see where it goes, because that's the only way you're going to ever affect change on the on the bottom level. <laughs> right. That's a harsh reality. I never thought we would see it get to the point. I really, really had... You know, for a long time, I had faith in American leaders to actually do something right, but that that's gone. That's all <laughs> gone. There is no, there is not a, there is not a, there is not a group of politicians in Washington right now that care about anything that has anything to do with you know grassroots movements or anything like that. There's there's almost none. no, no, because they're the ruling class, right? Yeah, right. Right. They don't have to live in it. No. So why bother? <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> In a way, I mean, it kind of benefits them to sow social discord. It's like mm-hmm. we—it's like we said last week. Like uh, when you see what's ha- what, what was happening in the Capitol Hill autonomous zone, and you see what's happening—you uh, know, the protests that are happening around the United States—it's really a, conv- uh, a turn of convenience for the handlers to use the media 
to fixate particularly on the racial aspect of why people are protesting. Mm -hmm. right because once people start focusing on the other elements of it it's like there's this economic inequality as then they start talking about well why does this exist and who's responsible for it and we start asking questions that get us to the real the real problems they don't that this you know this is like a a 10-step chess play to make sure that nobody's questioning the real status quo yeah right yeah yeah, they don't want people to actually attack the statues. Do something. Yeah. Attack the statues. Don't attack the policy. Mm-hmm. Don't 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 uh, attack each other. Attack each other. Oh, viciously attack each other. Yep. We love it when you guys attack each other and cancel each other and even hurt each other. We love it. Mm-hmm. It's theater for us. Yeah, because it's what, a way of uh, ignoring all the actual problems. That's right. Yeah. And deflecting from the real issues. Yeah. Right. Because if people knew, like, if they could see past the curtains and they. They realize just how, uh, you know, just how high a degree of control that very, a very small group of people had in the United States. They'd probably fucking lose their shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They'd probably lose their shit. We're talking like less than a thousand people here mm-hmm. that are like rep- that make up a class that's so far monetarily gone from your reality that they're not, they don't consider them. That's what I was saying. Like, you know, like even Paul McCartney being a billionaire. For example, he's still mm-hmm. in the lower class. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's a group of, there's a very exclusive group of people. We're not in oh, it. Yeah. We're, n- we're not in it. Oh, yeah. Nor is any pleb in that group. No Paul. Yeah, Mc- you might think you're rich at a billion dollars, but then, you know, you look at Jeff Bezos. Oh, God. Something like a hundred billion dollars yeah. he's actually worth, and that's after the divorce. You know, the thing, the thing with Bezos is at least he's out in the open. There's so many of these people that live their lives hidden behind their empire. That's why, you know, it's easy to ask a question. It's like, well, how could there be so much control around, I don't know, say, you know, coal production? Yeah, mm-hmm. well, that's that's it. Like, you know, a lot of people still probably don't know who the Koch brothers were or, you know, mm-hmm. the surviving Koch brother. They probably didn't know that the entire coal empire was basically being promulgated by this these two brothers. Mm-hmm. Because they were hiding behind the corporations that they owned. They had merged and acquired many, many of their competitors. They created a vertically scaled infrastructure that would hide their true identity from the processes. Mm-hmm. And the billionaires, the people who are act- who actually represent that class of 1,000 people, you know, at least half of them to 65% of them aren't, don't live their lives in the open. Those mm-hmm. are the people you really have to be concerned about. Mm-hmm. Right. Bezos is you can track Bezos everywhere he goes. You can you can do a Bezos watch. You can create a newspaper. He can't yeah. he can't afford to live his life closed off. But a lot of these guys, uh, men and women, it's not just guys. I just stupidly clumsily referred to a group of people as guys. That's not good. Um, a lot of these folks, they're uh, they they don't have any interest in living in the spotlight like a Jeff Bezos does. Right. Bezos They'd rep- rather lurk in the shadows. Bezos represents the sociopathic, personalistic uh, mm-hmm. uh, aspirations of that class of people. Yeah, he's part of that uh, rock star entrepreneur kind of right. class of people. Right. Yeah. That can do all the, the you know interviews and jet set around and build clocks in mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't really understand. Where was this? It's somewhere in Texas. You got to be kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First like, of all, like Western Texas. Okay, first of all, how many fucking mountains are there in Texas? That one. Just the one. <laughs> Just the one. That's <laughs> the fucking one. And Te- he hollowed it out and turned into a clock. Texas really doesn't is not known for its mountainous terrain. No, I think I, I saw a picture of it. It's not like a mountain mountain. Like well, it, well, it's I've not seen... like the Rocky Mountains. It's like what we would refer to as the Hamilton Mountain as a mountain. Like it's a, it's more of a fucking foothill. Truthfully, though, I, I think, I think I have seen pictures of like El Paso and shit. Mm-hmm. And I think I do remember seeing mountains. There's mountains, but it's not like the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, they're not mountains. They're certainly not prominent in the mm-hmm. central and eastern part of the state. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, he found one, and he's putting a fucking clock in there. In Texas. Yeah. You know, and it just it, it's going to be one of those things. Like, uh, it's one of those things, kind of like Mount Rushmore. Like, he's just going to have it, and then it's going to be like a weird 
tourist attraction. And then 200 years later, uh, society will find a way to find that clock racist or offensive in some way and tear it down. Or when society completely collapses and forgets that all of this actually happened, somebody will stumble upon that clock and think uh, these the super genius uh, master race uh, built it. Since or you like that. since you can no longer verbally ask the moron on the subway beside you what time it is, <laughs> yeah, you'll have to refer to the mountain clock. Yeah, the mountain clock, <laughs> the ten thousand year super accurate mountain clock. No, it'll be like the fucking Mayan calendar. Everyone's like, woo, what does it mean? Woo. I just, I just, I wish I could understand. Like, the only thing that strikes me about these people that have way more money than they know what to do with is they simply find ways to spend the money than they ha- that they have way more than they know how to do, than they know what to do with. Oh, yeah. They just find reasons to do ludicrous, asinine, ridiculous. When you have that much money, it's like you have to, you got to hemorrhage some of it. Yeah, well, <laughs> on, you, you, would, you would think a 50% divorce would be enough, but this guy. No, he's Jesus, still... Jesus, this guy's going the, full bore. Still the richest man <laughs> in, in, in the world He's going on paper. He's going full bore, man. Yeah. He's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not stopping anytime When you have soon. that much money. Don't give half your money he's away. He's got robot dogs. Dude, I tell you, don't give half your money away to charity. Do the right thing. Get divorced, give half of your profits away to your wife, and wash your hands, okay? Like, this is the lesson of our society. This is this is how, how it is, okay? <laughs> Imagine how many people... Give half your money away to your wife, get, and to, to, to your ex-wife, that's, and then still have enough money to hollow out a mountain and put a clock in you know, it. You know what like, that is, Jeff? A, Jeff? That's a Jeff, huge... That's, Jeff. A, that's a, such a big dick Jeff? move. Like, it's like, fuck. Jeff, you know whatever. what this is? Do you know what this is, Jeff? The amount of money that you gave to your wife, Jeff, could probably provide clean drinking water for a billion people. <laughs> could That's, probably yeah. fix the inner city education problem. Yeah, we'll take it up with his wife then. <laughs> you know what? That's she, a good she, idea. She's got the money. I think she was actually <laughs> uh, planning on donating so a, a good chunk of it, if I remember correctly. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, she's not completely bankrupt. Yeah. True. Like morally, I mean. Yeah. You know? What a guy who would give away half of his entire earnings to his wife to say, Mm. fuck off, I don't want to deal with you anymore, without realizing what he could have done with that money had he decided to do something sensible with it. Do you think it was an actual settlement, or legally he just had to do that? We'd have to read about it. Yeah. I don't don't really know. I I don't don't know if he... uh like paid her off i think that was no, no, no. Just, i think no. that was just how it had to happen no i think i think court. it did go through a divorce court i think yeah. i think i i believe he ended up giving her more than he had to hmm. yeah but again again it's like i don't understand why that same like this is a woman that you hate enough to get rid of in your life uh, you're giving her half of your money like do you hate the rest of humanity enough to fucking not consider the possibility that maybe that money is better spent elsewhere do you not give mm. a shit that much? Is that who you are? Yeah. Like, you, you gotta just, Jeff, Jeff, listen, man. At this point, you gotta realize that this is a legacy issue for you, okay? You can go about your psychopathic ventures and spend your money the way that you want to. There's no doubt about that. But you gotta start thinking about the type of legacy you're leaving for this planet if you have any bit of culpability left in you. I don't know what kind of legacy it is, really. Um, it's the legacy. I, I don't think. I don't think. Like, unlike unlike Elon, I don't think Bezos has. Uh, he, he doesn't have the the type of brand, I guess, that would uh, spark any interest or anything like that. I don't think there's any teenager that's looking at Amazon.com and thinking like, "That's fucking awesome! I want an Amazon.com T-shirt or something like that." <laughs> Yeah. But you know, people love SpaceX. People love Tesla. Like those those are like durable brands that are like that are, that have been good for Elon. You know? Those are cool things that people actually look to. Whether or not it's good, whatever, I don't know. You I know you hate Tesla. I don't hate, like, I don't hate it. I see it for what it is. Yeah, but it's like it's still it's such a good brand that it, it makes Elon look good. You're right. I'm not, I did not never once disagreed with you there. I just said that they're really just making an unremarkable product is all I said. Sure. That's it. I didn't say whether I loved it or hated it. I Mm -hmm. did. I didn't. I'm just stating facts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when this is. Well, he does a lot of crazy shit. I mean, he had a flamethrower. 
And that seems perfectly logical. Why would anybody question him about owning a a flamethrower? Because clearly he knows in his own mind what he's trying to achieve. And who the fuck are we to try to talk him out of it, apparently? Because because just because you're rich doesn't mean something's a good idea. That's fucking stupid. Yeah, well, he made them. He made 5,000 of them and sold them. That is incredibly fucking stupid. And not only on that, it's reckless. Yeah. That is stupid and reckless. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I know. He's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. I get that. You get that. The theme of this show is smart guys doing really stupid things and not really, you know, caring. Mm -hmm. They're they're spending their money. They're thinking like they're creating a legacy for themselves. But at the end of the day, like when they die and they're six feet under, there ain't going to be no fucking Jeff Bezos statue. Um, I think there will be. Bought and paid for by Amazon. He'll make it. He'll make it happen. Luke, it'll get pulled down. It'll be. 200 feet tall no he he's seen as a great incarcerator of uh low socioeconomic mm. people enslaving people into his warehouses that have to piss into bottles and then get fired for taking five minutes off is that the legacy yeah. you're trying is that the legacy is that is that what you want to be remembered for that's what he wants well you know what he's well on his way mm-hmm. i don't think anybody with a soul or a moral conscience would ever look at that as a legacy that was desirable that is absurd. Yeah. That's absurd. You have to be some kind of nuts nuts uh, to believe that that's an appropriate legacy. Mm-hmm. Any statue built by the Amazon Corporation will get gratuitously fucking pulled down and then melted down for its metal components mm-hmm. and then sold on the black market somewhere in Guangzhou. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he was gonna if he was gonna build a uh, a statue of himself. Where would it have to be so that that doesn't happen? Right on the front lawn inside the gates at Amazon. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> on yeah. top of the trans, it's not called the Transamerica Pyramid anymore, but that pyramid shaped building in San Francisco, right on the top. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Standing like Christ with his arms open and his, and his chin up. Mm-hmm. Right? Like Christ the Red, Cristo Renditor in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yep. Yep. Just like that. Mm. Yeah, 250 foot statue of Jeff Bezos. Yeah, it shoots flames out of its mouth. White robe, fucking all a <laughs> branch around the head. Yeah. Yeah. Long yeah. flowing hair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bible in his head. <laughs> and you can talk to it like an Amazon Echo. <laughs> it has all the answers. Hey, Jeff. Where do you think all the servers are? They're inside of the statue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it has all, this thing is the Oracle. It has all the yeah. answers. Mm. <laughs> It's actually his dead body frozen. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, God damn. Oh. To be thought out on a later date. That was, la- that was yesteryear's psychopath. That was, mm-hmm. that was some Walt Disney shit where they fundamentally believed, like, these people were, they, they, were, they were sociopaths, right? Is he actually frozen? He's frozen. So that's a real thing. It's a real thing. Holy shit. I always thought that was just a nope. story. Nope. He was asked to be cryogenically frozen and told to be unfrozen when they developed a cure for cancer. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Bring back. Because you know what? It wasn't bad enough that we have to live through the legacy racism of every Disney movie ever. Why not just bring back the man himself? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's not. Imagine, a, there's not imagine a, in like a hundred years, he, they actually unfreeze him and he comes back. Oh, what would God. he fucking think of the world? Uh, didn't we talk about this before? Uh, probably. Probably. I think we did. He'd be freaking out. He'd be like, oh, there's Jews everywhere. Jews. They own everything. Like, what? They own everything. Yeah. he's mm. He was just a, a unre- like remarkably intolerant individual. Just, yeah. <laughs> there's, no yeah. Other, there's no other real way to explain it. He's mm. just, yeah, no, what would he think of the world? I think, I think, I don't think the first place that he would go would necessarily be like the racism. I think mm. anybody who died in, I don't even know when he died, like the 70s. I don't know. Earlier, maybe? Seventies, yeah. I think. I think he died in the seventies. I don't know. You know what? This is I'm not gonna I, I I'm I I apologize to people listening. I don't know. Um All those Walt Disney fans. Yeah. Really that right. really care. Those people who've watched Frozen thirty five times and not even with their daughters. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have daughters. <laughs> <laughs> that you sat in your parents' basement and watched Elsa and Frozen a dozen times. You, you know all the songs off by heart. They love the songs. They love the songs. 
And the dancing. And the implicit uh, Jew hate that oh. somehow permeates its way into every friggin' Disney movie, even though oh, the bastard's yeah, been dead a, for a long time. A lot of, a lot of blonde hair in Frozen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look, they've never got rid of the stereotypes, right? No. No. Everybody's an Uber munch and everybody's a super baby. Everybody's a super child. Everybody's got the typical prototypical German. All of it is uh, World War II fascist Germany, right? This ideal. What this, about Aladdin? Oh. <laughs> Aladdin was written at a time when people had a wildly misinterpreted view of the Middle East and India. Mm. Just mm. and it just it's imbued with racism because of ignorance. Right. Right. There's just no attempt to reconcile with the culture of these places when they made these movies. Nor was there any societal pressure to do so. So mm. what you produced were these fucking insane movies that were just like, wow, that is yeah. just outs- outlandishly racist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, fucking stereotypes. And now, like with the new one, you got Will Smith playing fucking uh, the genie. Yep. What the fuck is going on? He looks crazy. Yeah, there weren't uh, like where is this? Where where was this? Where was the setting for this movie? Like Damascus? Where were the black people during this? Time? <laughs> yeah. It's not even a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I never watched the new one. Oh Jesus! I never saw it either. I can I only imagine it's terrible. Mm. Well, you know Will Smith's in it, so if he had, if he takes a dump on something and sticks it in a box, it's at least silver quality. That's true, right? He's at least got a silver nugget on his hands. Well, he's done some garbage recently. Yeah, yeah, he's getting a little bit more uh, uh, nuanced with his roles. He did that one movie with his kid, which was fucking terrible. Oh, yeah. But what was that other movie where he was fighting like an 18-year-old version of himself? (laughs) What? Yeah, (laughs) actually it was pretty good. Newer? Oh, yeah, yeah, within the last two or three years. Huh. Where he's fighting, he's fighting, like, it's actually a really good movie, like, he, uh, he takes out a target at first. He's like a, a, an assassin for a fucking American, you know, the intelligence agency, right? Okay. Take, takes out a fucking uh, target from like 1,500 meters on a moving train, but then he has this epiphany. He's like, oh, there was a young boy that was sitting in front of my target. I could have easily hit him. So he decides mm. to like prematurely retire and shit like that. And then this one dude shows back up in his old stomping ground and starts like creating a bunch of tyranny and shit. So he's recommissioned into action only to find out that he's actually fighting a version of his younger self. <laughs> yeah, created in a, in a lab by a corporation who was trying to create super soldiers. So is it is it like a CGI version of him? 100%. Oh, okay, okay. Absolutely. So it actually looks like him. Um it does look like him, but mm. the 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 um the the reproduction of the CGI isn't perfect, so okay. it does look a little bit plasticky. It does look, mm. a, but it's good to the point where it's like, yeah, you can see it. Like it's seventeen year old Will Smith. It's just okay. that you can tell the face is a little bit Damn. CGI'd, but like you can tell it's directly taken from him when he was seventeen years old. Very very good. Um, Interesting. Yeah yeah. As, well, did you ever see The Irishman? Yes. Yeah, that was interesting what they did with that one. Facial recognition Mm -hmm. is becoming, you know, more and more sophisticated all the time. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's facial recognition uh, mapping on top of CGI Mm -hmm. is what that is. So they're just using overlapping technologies to come up with this. To make them look younger. Exactly. To take something, like, you know, he has a lot of, he has a huge library to to pull from, right? Like, when he was 17, he was doing Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah, yeah. You could take that information from that time and then reproduce it you know mm-hmm. yeah so with uh facial, that's fucking crazy it is crazy i never heard of that yeah yeah i'm gonna have to check that out oh uh, it's a cool. good it's a good movie it's a good movie mm. i highly recommend it i'm not a movie guy either so mm. if i go as far as to recommend something it's probably at least worth watching it's good yeah yeah so i, ne- I never do movies but <laughs> i think you know yeah like you know given given the fact that we're starting to go back onto movies yeah we could probably cut it off for the time being and maybe Make it make a dip back into it. I don't know. <laughs> Our movies really where we're trying to go here. I'm Will Smith is not the enemy, people. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not. <laughs> no, he's for all very for all, inspirational guy. Actually. For all intents and purposes, a very thoughtful guy and yeah. uh, very uh, uh, gifted actor. For the most mm-hmm. part, you know, save mm-hmm. for a few dud roles here and there. Couple duds. But you know, when you when you have the 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 resume of a Will Smith, you're allowed to drop a dud or two. Nobody's questioning you for that shit. Well, he was on such a hot streak for so long. 
well, it wasn't that he was rolling sevens. He was creating the sevens. He was taking he was taking concepts of movies and he was making them believable, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean he's actually yep. a good actor. Wild West. <laughs> I am legend. I am legend. Yeah, oh, buddy. That's a really good one. Yes, it is. Holy fuck. I I robot. I robot. You know. That movie still holds up. Still holds up. It came out in like two thousand eight, maybe? Yeah, yeah. A long time ago. But yeah, just to speak to the giftedness <laughs> and some of the things that he's done that are just really, really well done. You know. Good actor, man. Good actor. One of my Great. one of my top five male actors for sure. For yeah. sure. Matt Damon would be Me another too. one. Matt Damon. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Big time. Do you ever see The Martian? No. Oof. Still haven't. It's good. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. You ever seen Suburbicon? I haven't. Oh, it's really fucked up. Fuck. It's really good, though. <laughs> Suburbicon. Yeah. What the hell is that all about? Oh, man. So uh, Matt Damon plays this, like, dad in this uh, weird, like, 1950s-esque, like, suburban neighborhood, right? Oh, no. And it's... It's hard to explain because it, it's like you think the movie is going to be one thing when when you get into it because there's like foreshadowing of like racism and stuff like that. Cause it's like this big sprawling suburb of like all white people, and it's like that picturesque like oh, the mailman, you know, and all that all that fucking bullshit. 1955 and then, suburbia, and then it gets so fucking weird. Really? It gets so fucking dark. Really? Yeah. So that's the con part. Yeah, I'd I'd recommend it. I will definitely take a it look at it. It gets really that. weird. I'm I'm a um Damon that. enthusiast, so I will definitely take a look into that. Or um what was that other one that he did? I think the the same year. It's like downsizing or something. Downsize me. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That yeah, was yeah. a good one too. Yeah. Yeah, was it really good? I didn't. I di- didn't seem to have any interest. Weird. Didn't seem to have any interest in the concept of that one when it came out. But I can be convinced otherwise. I would think it wasn't the best. No. Not the best Damon movie, but like it's <laughs> it's still like the concept you're, you're, is again, fucking. You're, you're Will Smithing it, right? Because Damon has been in a lot of mm-hmm. very very good movies. Yeah. So and he's been the centerpiece of a few of them. So it's not. Oh easy. my god! Yeah. It's not easy for you to like pick. The best, the like departed. good, good Will Hunting. The talented Mr. Ripley is probably oh, yeah. one of my favorite. I if if you haven't seen the talented Mr. Ripley, dude, I highly suggest. Like, yeah, I still haven't. Big time, man. Like, awesome the way it's done. Just yeah, really, really. Yeah, good. he's good. Yeah, yeah. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> like, Damon, <laughs> fucking guys. Even though in like, uh, you, you ever watch Team America: World Police? No, and I don't want to. No, no. Oh my god, it's so good. Really? It's from uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone that do oh, South Park, right? Maybe I have seen it. I can't believe you've never seen this. I, I've probably seen it. It's like one of the best <laughs> movies ever made. I've probably seen it. It's fucking... <laughs> it's, all, it's all puppets. Oh, fuck. It I came out know. in like 2004. Yeah, no, maybe not. It's all, it's all puppets, and it's about this like... This, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> this, this fictional like international police force called Team America... And it's like that it's seems a, very international in its in its origins. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> it's just like suppose it's it's basically policing the globe. It's it's like a great, it's a great, uh, it's just full of satire, right? Jesus, it's a great take on how America polices the globe and how they usually never get anything done because they just blow shit up and then say they <laughs> saved the day. You know, <laughs> it's so it's so good though. I didn't think Hollywood, but they would. make fun of actors in that, and they make fun of Matt Damon and like. Matt Damon's character in that movie can only say Matt Damon for some reason. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Is it Matt Damon saying Matt Damon? It's not Matt Damon. They didn't get really? any, they didn't get anybody to do oh, it. No. They, they're just talking shit about Matt Damon. Oh no. And Alec Baldwin. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, everybody has their right, you know. I'm not going to defend Hollywood uh, people in Hollywood. I mean, they're showing their true colors right now in the current political climate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's gotten to the point now where you actually appreciate 
the actors who can just stay out of it or mm-hmm. the actresses and actors who can stay out of it mm-hmm. who aren't taking like this staunch left or staunch right sort of thing. And, you know, they're going and they're using their social media feeds to influence people to think politically that, you know, what they believe is true. Like these people are not qualified to tell you what to think about things that have nothing to do with Hollywood. Most mm-hmm. of these people, and I mean this very, very politely, never graduated high school. They never graduated high school. They came to L.A. on a dream. They got really lucky, and they have no right, unfortunately, to tell you about anything that means anything. Yeah. Unless it's Hollywood. Okay, so next time you're, you know, following your favorite tool on Instagram or whatever, and don't don't buy into the horse shit, okay? If they're getting political with you, just blow it off. (laughs) You have no obligation Mm. to believe that anything that's coming out of these people's mouths is factual or true or even has any merit whatsoever i think because they're just getting bored fucking right they can't work right now no i don't know is that the case though yeah they can't i mean they're not doing anything well it's they're not filming anything i mean uh animated shows are still going obviously hollywood's just a green screen economy now like you just you don't need you don't need you don't need you still need you still need the crew who can work at a distance? Like they don't have to be, you know, neck and neck with each other. It's not like depends. It's not, it's not like you had a stunt team of like three hundred people build a locational setting where a car was exploding, and you needed like eight hundred hands to put all the materials in place. Th- those days mm-hmm. are gone. That's gone. It's gone. Like with the amount of people that are actually employed by the conventional movie set now, compared mm-hmm. to what it used to be, I think you could easily afford to distance in a spacious studio. In Hollywood. Yeah, but I still think... I don't think you can get away with that with the uh, the rules. The rules. The rules. Well, we'll not allow it. That's, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Not that it's not... Can, can be actually be done. I think but it's... like, I, you know... I think it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, when you make that statement, I feel like you're thinking that the United States has the same protocol as Canada does, for example. California does. Hmm... <laughs> Actually, California is more fucked up. Yeah, because yeah. they they can't get anything right. No, <laughs> they they've slipped back into phase one. Uh, in many ways, not just in the COVID mm-hmm. thing. They they've basically they went from being the ultimate influencer on global matters, uh, how mm-hmm. people feel about things and trendsetter, to being exposed as the backward place of hypocrites that that it really is. <laughs> I'm yeah. so I, I don't want to be rude to anybody in California. I know there's a lot of people that think that you know being progressive is right and stuff like that, but it's not the way you're doing it. Uh, the way that I mean, the entirety of the concept of the state of California being wholly unsustainable. Uh, the people that live there really don't have any right to tell anybody else about how to live. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's the most unsustainable model I think in North America, in terms of a city. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, safe from like Phoenix, Arizona, which I yeah, mean, they yeah, should yeah. never build a city in the middle of a fucking desert. I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but if it wasn't for air conditioning, I don't, like how could you possibly? Well, again, that's ex- that's there. exactly it, right? Like, so so what? You're, where are you importing water from now? Yeah. Your your citizens couldn't survive if it wasn't for the highly intensive energy usage, and you did this for what? Fun to have to, to have <laughs> to a have city fun. in the desert is that that was the ultimate goal or like was there a reason for it or yeah what's the industry there <laughs> S- sweating um rich bottled, bottled ri- rich sweat. rich people with work at home businesses and so. and and people who own timeshares uh, from other states and provinces in Canada hmm. pretty much it yep yeah. Weird fucking spot. Sorry, it's not a sustainable bit model. Neither is Los, <laughs> not, neither is Los Angeles. You're built right on top of the San Andreas fault lines. Your <laughs> whole city is built on a glass house. You can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't sustain yourself. Uh, your water usage, your energy usage, it's that none of it makes sense. Your entire agricultural industry operates on on borrowed uh, power and borrowed water. <laughs> it just you know to have a uh, you know to to, to have a, a population of like 32 million people believe that they're so socially progressive when they are actually completely the opposite that's mm. kind of the remarkable thing about California Californians are amazingly um they lack self-reflection 
they don't need it. <laughs> well, that's, that's the I, whole. That's the, the whole. I suppose. Point. I suppose if you've made it your mission to act like you're the most progressive people in the world, and this is where your progressive policy is coming from, then you owe it to people to lead by example. Mm-hmm. But you don't. No, you don't. You're enti- the entire. You know, safe for like Northern California, where it rains a little bit more in the mountains. Like the entire south part of the state is basically on borrowed resources. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense at all. So you can drive your Prius, but just, you know, know your very existence in Los Angeles is contributing to the detriment of the environment and the economy and shit. It's not, it's not, you're not doing anything for anybody. I know you're, I know. But it's propped up by actors. That's the thing. Yeah, when they got a couple thumbs up with their Facebook post and they thought that, you know, what they said had some sort of gravitas or something, but they don't. Mm -hmm. They don't. (laughs) You know, do you know how much fucking... Uh, do you know how much uh, resources are required to uh, to produce a California pistachio or an or an avocado? Um, avocados are isn't not- it like a uh, like there's a lot of almonds that come out <laughs> of, of of California, but isn't it like a gallon of water per almond? Yeah, because required? in order to fucking uh, grow the almonds, you need to grow the trees. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I'm pretty sure they don't produce almonds right away. So it's like a super intensive practice just to get the trees up to production standard. Mm -hmm. And then once you do, yeah, yeah. Gallons and gallons and gallons of water for every tree, every That's one of their main exports is fucking almonds. Well, you know. And avocados. Well, the the downfall is, and I think this is kind of the trade-off that that they're experiencing here, is that everybody's invested in California as a uh, agriculturally productive state because it does have a lot of viable land. It just doesn't have the resources to sustain itself when it tries to produce all these wonderful things. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, for a good chunk of our year in Canada, when, you know, up here is essentially tundra, Mm -hmm. uh, we have to import our fruits and vegetables. Some of it we get from Mexico and South America, Central America, a lot of it we get from California. So there's this weird trade-off where even like even though we know in the rest of North America that whatever's happening in California is completely unsustainable by conventional standards, mm-hmm. we actually sickly rely on them for the majority of what they produce. Mm-hmm. So we're caught. We're caught in a hmm. in a tough spot when it comes down to yeah, you know, changing the way that that agricultural model operates because I'm not sure you could, I'm not sure you have that level of fertility anywhere else in, you know, on the continent. Mm-hmm. It might just be like the 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 fertile place in, you know, but there's no way of changing it now because you know our economic systems are so intertwined with pulling products out of California, redistributing them amongst you know. 49 other states and uh you know 11 provinces and three territories and probably not the territories i don't know i don't know how far the strawberries go i'm pretty sure you're not going to find them in in yellow knife i think you i think you can get them but they're very 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 expensive well you know if that's the case then what's the point of bringing them up there fuck it Mm -hmm. fuck it if you're going to be charging people like 12 dollars for a fucking half pint of strawberries just just you know what maybe that's not a good idea like the cost of living in none of it is insane Everything has to be shipped there because nothing can possibly grow there. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I guess there's some some people that are making enough money where they can actually import oranges or something like that. But for the most part, most people that live up there are still living off seal. Well, um, for the people who actually do have jobs, wages are hyperinflated. Mm-hmm. Like, um, so, you know, like if you, uh, there is a, uh, is it a Popeye's? In Inuvik, I think there's like a Popeyes in Inuvik. There's there's a fast food restaurant. There's a fast food restaurant really? somewhere in Inuvik. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, like a, like a legitimate chain restaurant. One that you wouldn't suspect. One that was that would just take you off guard. Like be like, what the fuck? Like in, Inu- <laughs> in Inuvik, they do have a Tim Hortons. Um, yeah. The people well, that see. work there, they make considerably more on average than the people that work down here in Tim Hortons, and the reason for that is the cost of living is outrageous mm-hmm. right they also have like a bowling alley and shit in it in Uvic. like they've got these little creature comforts but these yeah. people are all making inflated wages because when you go to the supermarket to buy your 12 dollar half bushel of strawberries you got to be able to afford it yeah exactly right? so like you know um people like it's a uh, to take a, an example that's closer to home and maybe less frozen i mean look at look look at what happens in alberta 
Alberta is a, uh, a province that exists in the west part of Canada. Um, one of the things that Alberta tends to have a problem with in terms of the Canadian economy is getting enough workers into positions that, uh, so like, you know, there's huge shortages of service sector workers in Alberta, um, you know, and they're pulling people in from all these other provinces. They're pulling in, you know, talented and untalented labor from all over the country to come in and say, hey, work, work these jobs and whatever, right? Giving people two and three thousand dollar signing bonuses to work at McDonald's for 22 bucks an hour. Mm-hmm. Why are they why are they doing that? They're not doing that because they want the McDonald's worker to get rich. They're doing that because the average bachelor apartment in Calgary, which is a city in the south part of Alberta, is like fucking uh, 13 or 1400 bucks. Right? You want to live in somebody's basement, it's going to cost you like 1200 bucks. You know, it's it's like uh, the cost of living will dictate what ultimately what it, in a responsible country, the, the way it should work is that the cost of living should ultimately dictate your wages and what you make. Mm. Right? They should be adjusted for the inflationary measures of whatever part of the country you're in. Yeah, but that doesn't happen here. No. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> beyond expensive to live in toronto yeah no it is but people are still making like 14 bucks an hour toronto exists on something else in my opinion though toronto exists on people knowing what toronto is and coming from a long way away to live in a place like toronto because that's the place where they want to live like it doesn't attract the normal canadian true right yeah it's it's not like you know remember when we went down to the beer fest like uh four years ago Mm -hmm. and i'm walking around uh downtown toronto i'm trying to find fucking cigarettes i'm trying to find a convenience store that has cigarettes Mm -hmm. and i go up to about a half dozen people before i find somebody who even speaks english right nobody's from the city nobody's from around here nobody knows where anything is yeah. It took me about 15 minutes to find somebody, and it was a garage attendant of one of the high-rise condos. <laughs> yeah. I've already walked around like three city blocks at this point. I'm like, yo, bro, listen, where's the convenience store? It still took him about 30 seconds. He's like, oh, he's fucking, you know, this guy's mm. not living downtown Toronto. He just no, knows by know. muscle memory. He's living in fucking North York somewhere or some <laughs> yeah, shit, yeah. right? He's probably driving in all the way from like 45 minutes in from Ajax or something. For sure. Yeah. There's that's no, how you have to do it now. There's no way. Well, if you're a regular person working in Toronto, then yeah. Yeah. That's how you have to do it. Yeah. You never get to see any of the people that live there. Mm-hmm. There's two sides of that, too. There's there's people that live there, and they're inc- incredibly reclusive. They don't mm-hmm. want to be seen or deal with the riffraff. But the other part of the great mystery of downtown Toronto is the lack of occupation of the buildings. Many of those buildings are sitting at like 30% occupancy, 35% occupancy. They were Mm -hmm. built for clientele that aren't coming. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They were built to whitewash money from other countries is what they were built for, right? Mm -hmm. It's a legitimate way to take illegitimate money and channel it into something that's legitimate. Real estate happened to be that one hot thing that was going on for about seven or eight years there where people were whitewashing their dirty money from their own economies and reinvesting it in other economies that would create these wonderful world city looking places like Toronto that would ultimately end up, you know, 30% occupied in the downtown area. It looks really nice, but it's a museum piece. <laughs> it's a museum piece. Hmm. I would be interested to see what the uh, rate of occupancy is in lower Manhattan too, in terms of their uh, residential units. I, I would. Hmm. I'm sure yeah, there's I'm true. sure there's a level of vacancy there that's probably a little bit uh that's that's there's a story there that's not being told. I'm pretty sure there is. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, you know, Toronto no different than anywhere else in the world. Some countries have done a little bit of a better job of making sure that their cosmopolitan city doesn't get out of control. Um but, you know, it it largely depends on uh personal local flavors. It's uh, the Canadian government decided uh, in, in the last decade that they were going full steam ahead with the the project of making Toronto a world city. You know, for for the most part, they've made it look like a world city. So if that was their objective, they've achieved it. Hmm. But it doesn't feel like a world city. It doesn't feel like it's a lived in place. It does, doesn't. Some of it doesn't even feel real. It's not organic. You know, and you know, walking around the streets on downtown Tor- uh, in downtown Toronto kind of validates that. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of visitors here but there's just not a lot of people living here mm-hmm. <laughs> the ones that do they don't want to talk to you <laughs> yeah. that's not very canadian <laughs> no well, it's it's just one of those spots you know yeah i guess so people want to be there 
but but can't afford to live there. Can't afford it. <laughs> so they can't go out. It's a nice place to go for a stroll, but I just I can't afford to stay over here. No. Yeah. yeah. No shit. I. Yeah, I think mm. there's definitely, uh, you know, it kind of you you're able to develop a lot more of an observational perspective living just outside of a city like that. I think if you lived inside of the city. Like, could you imagine what that would do to the philosophy and the the mind state, and even just how it would direct, how 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 it would impact our perception about the realities of things? Just being somebody who lived inside Toronto their whole life mm-hmm. and somebody who didn't. Well, I don't know. I've I've met people that have have been born in Toronto and lived mm-hmm. in Toronto their entire lives, and they have. They definitely have a disconnect with the rest of Canada or the way things are outside of the city. They think they're the most Canadian. Yeah. Nothing's more Canadian than Toronto. And yeah. and the rest of the country looks at Toronto and they're like, nothing's less Canadian than Toronto. <laughs> or that other things don't exist anywhere else yeah. in Canada. It's yeah. like you can't get fucking Thai food. Oh, God. Outside of Toronto, apparently. How many people, like, you know, like, I was on Google. I love, uh, I used to love writing Google reviews and stuff like that. But the thing is, like, you're competing with people. uh, And this was such a common thing. Like, every third review would be like, yeah, you know, it's pretty decent. But, you know, there's this better restaurant in Toronto. And it's just Mm. always this comparison to Toronto and whatever Toronto had. But Toronto, whatever Toronto has is always better, obviously, right? It's not... Yeah, clearly <laughs> they've never been to Montreal. No. <laughs> Way better food. No. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and, and well, here's the other thing, too. Like, uh, we've joked about this, too. Like, uh, there's people that are out there that think Toronto is just, like, this crown fucking jewel of a city. Like, it's just so aesthetically gorgeous and all this shit. It looks like a plain, run-of-the-mill, uninspired city. And if you don't believe me, go to any fucking city in Asia and you're going to quickly realize mm. just how far backwards we actually are. <laughs> like yeah. it's just it's not right to compare a city like Toronto or a city like Los Angeles or a city like Chicago or New York to the cities that are in Asia. There there's mm. no comparison to these places. Oh, it's like when you go to Kensington Market, like the entire place looks run down. Yeah. Big like tourist that's, att- that's big, your, big tourist that's your attraction spot? too. That's your spot? Huge that's- tourist attraction. That's the people. That's the thing that people love. What the fuck? Yeah. Well, you know like what? Shit. So with Europe, there's that history element. Obviously, like people, mm-hmm. people love that. I can appreciate that too. By the way, I'm not. I'm not against history. I like history a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am definitely not one of those people that is a proponent of pulling down and erasing history. I don't care how unsavory it is. It's something that will remind us to. to act in a certain way when a certain time comes along it acts as a referent to remind you that this is not the way to go about things history is if we did not have history we would fail we'd be doomed to repeat things over and over again Mm -hmm. it's a referent which allows us to learn from our mistakes and to move on and improve ourselves the erasure of that could be nothing but bad honestly and i know i know a lot of people are like oh fuck you you know you're not you don't make sense like you know i'm i i I believe in you know just blowing history up and replacing it well replacing Mm -hmm. it with what yeah with what what are you going to replace it with have you thought about that are you just Mm -hmm. so angry and so dedicated to the cause that you really don't care how you get there scorched earth doesn't matter what happens afterwards if not why don't you just go to you know you know, you you should have your finger on the nuclear button. Mm-hmm. You should. You sh- you're one of those people who literally you're irrational. You're out of control. You don't know how to rationalize your emotions with yourself, and you're the type of people that should have your finger on a nuclear button somewhere. Like you, you are impulsive. You are capable of acting without thinking about the consequences of the future. Don't mm-hmm. do it. It's not worth it. Mm-hmm. It's not worth it. These people are horrible people. Okay, they are by our standards. They're horrible people. I understand why they're doing what they're doing, but you can't. Yeah. It's not. It's not the right way to do it. Well, the problem is if you if you tear down all these, all these statues and try to try to erase history. I mean, they're trying to get these people out of history textbooks as well. Yeah. Then how do you explain? How do you explain how we got here? Yeah. Exactly. Like, what are you supposed to replace it with? Like, well, the- especially in the states, like they're trying to get rid of like George Washington and. 
y- you know, they're they're really going for it. They're really trying to get rid of American history. And it's like, then how do you explain how America started then? We ne- how, what, we, what are you going to teach them? We never got here. Christopher Columbus yeah. never arrived. We magically appeared somewhere around. Yeah. After the Indians were gone, white people magically appeared. Um, mm-hmm. Because obviously we can't talk about that part of history either. Yeah. Right? That's unsavory too. So we got to just gloss over that. So somewhere in the 1800s, we magically appeared. Yeah. Like middle 1800s, we magically appeared. We created a constitution for ourselves, set about creating a country that was completely puritanical, void of all of the ails of society in general. Mm-hmm. no current referent for anything that's happened. Why is there all this hostility currently? Why will the problems that we're trying to battle right now not be resolved by the pulling over of statues? None of that's answered. doesn't have to be. Mm-hmm. That stuff will still go on after this, and they're going to wonder why I thought we fixed this. You didn't fix anything. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking idiots. Now you're going to have a problem with reconciling certain parts of history you consider desirable with, with the current situation, and that's not going to work for you either. Just gonna make things worse. That's right. It's gonna make people more confused. That's right. Yeah. Why don't people, uh, you know, like nowadays, um, uh, why are there less and less racist people in society nowadays? Because of history. Mm -hmm. Because of history. Because we've learned. Why are there people like think about that? Everything we've learned. We've learned over time. We've learned. We've relearned to learn things. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, there was Jew hating, Irish hating, Italian hating, all this shit, you know, that was happening during the infancy of of the colonization of North America and shit. We've learned through history that those aren't the appropriate responses. Mm-hmm. Right, I don't see any monuments to people who subjugated Italian people or Irish people being pulled down and shit. Mm-hmm. Right, doesn't this doesn't this necessitate the uh, the uh, voice of every group who now needs to be heard, or are we just like focusing and fixating on one particular group? I understand that they're a very very big group, but there are other groups of people that were subjugated as well. Right, right. Are their histories as important? Are they less important? How do we rewrite that history? Mm-hmm. That all of this doesn't make sense. If you're one of those people who says scorched earth at all costs, cancel history. You start thinking about these questions that we're posing here very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. This is not an easy subject, and it's not a black and white thing that you can simply just erase a chalkboard and start over again. You've got a whole bunch of uncomfortable truths to reconcile if you choose to go down that path. That's that's crazy. That's crazy Mm -hmm. that people don't get it. They don't care. They don't. They don't. It's you got this lynch mob mentality, and they're they're literally they're gathering at night around inanimate objects to show their displeasure with the system Mm -hmm. now tell me how the fucking establishment doesn't win when this is the case (laughs) right yeah that's insane that's crazy like we're not fighting the real problem here (laughs) no and i don't know if uh i don't know if you can convince those people to see what the real problem actually is in the long run i I don't i don't think you can get those people because it's it's all ideological to them and it's too personal. Yeah. It's become a personal vendetta for so many people now. Yeah, it's become, that too. It's become the, the, the justification for the, 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 the right to raise your arms. I mean, your guns. Mm-hmm. You know, like raise your pitchforks, so to speak. It's not. Yeah. But like I said, there's a legitimate movement behind that. There's a legitimate movement. There's a legitimate um, concern behind that, a societal concern. It's a legitimate one. It's just that you're not attacking you're not going to fix any problem by by the current trajectories you're not Mm -hmm. there's nothing that there is not a single statue that you can pull down that will have so much influence as to change the system structurally Mm -hmm. fight where the fight needs to be taken don't fucking take your fuck Mm -hmm. you know you know like that's such a that's such a fucking uh 2015 social media move it's like, don't mm. attack the system. You know what we'll do? We'll sit behind our proverbial keyboard and mouse and we'll attack the fringes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, we'll attack what's easy. That's it. Low, low hanging fruit. Low hanging fruit. Right. Exactly. You can pull down a statue. You can't actually like implement a good policy. Gang beat a cop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can't gang beat Fuck. a cop because you're angry at police brutality. But for some reason, pulling down a statue of somebody who lived 300 years ago is, is going to fix everything. <laughs> well, we'll see where it 
it leads them. I yeah. Guess. Well, yeah. So, fuck yeah. yeah. You know, it's going to be an interesting thing. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how that all mm. plays out. And you know, fuck. Hope for the best. Nah. Hope we can all get through this. <laughs> nah. On, just, on a good note. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah buddy. No Without doubt. complete anarchy. <laughs> yeah. No. It's uh. You know. It's when they all start fighting the right fight. That's all. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a good amount of enthusiasm out there for change. It's just that we all have to be focused and talking the same language when we're when we're doing so. Mm-hmm. It's not uh, the the language that's being spoken out there right now. It's being fashioned in the context of poli- police brutality and Black Lives Matter, but there's other conversations there that are being silenced because that narrative is being elevated. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. a lot of desperation out there. There's a lot of uh, disenfranchisement with the way that the average American feels about their political establishment and what, how much it's actually representative of their interests. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. We have our own problems in Canada too. It's, it's not as bad, but it's, you know, we got it. We have our issues here too. Of course. hundred percent. Yeah. We've talked about them many times. Mm-hmm. Of course, our, our situation is not one of self determinism like the United States is. They fought for the right to, make autonomous decisions more or less to a, you know, a, a large degree, but mm. not, not the case in Canada. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not the case at all. Not the case at all. That's for sure. <clears throat> anyway, on that note. Yeah, buddy. Probably end this. Yep. I'm going on for a long fucking time. A lot, a lot of good content. A lot of good know. stuff. It's just good, man. Yeah. It's good. Thanks for listening to Luke Hamilton Tonight podcast. Um... Yeah, you can you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Luke Jamilton. Also follow me on Parlor if you're fucking crazy. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those extreme Parlor users. Yeah. If if you're if you're on the uh, intellectual dark web, are you on the fringe? Hit it up. <laughs> Join us on Parlor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know. That's what you have to do. Okay. Yeah. Good. Whatever. I like I love it. Love yeah. it. <laughs> 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 See you later. <laughs> <laughs>